This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 756, recorded on May 14, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent, and everybody else. Nice uh, day out. Out my window. Oh, it's amazing. It's an amazing. Today is the best day of the year so far. Perfect weather, fluffy clouds, temperature in the low 70s, low humidity. Why am I not fishing? 23 <laughs> Celsius. <laughs> uh, you could have gone, you know, if you wanted to, you would just say nah, goodbye to it. To be honest with you, at this point in my life, I'd rather be doing this. <laughs> All right. I'd like to hear that. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Hey, Rich. Um, we've got uh, 79 degrees, cloudy. It wasn't cloudy this morning. It was beautiful this morning, but it's kind of clouded up. But we're okay. Uh, you know, I thought that we were going to uh, be in the 90s for good at this point, but no. It's uh, backed off, and we're 80s for a little while, and that's fine with me. You guys could use some rain. We could. We're getting a little bit, but we're about an inch or so behind right now. Yep. But West Texas is like eight inches behind. Yeah. What do you uh, keep track of Texas, Dixon? I keep track of where our food comes from. <laughs> oh, that's sure. very good. California, Texas, and Florida, what, what and they're comes, all drought-stricken right now. What do we get from Texas, Dixon? I'm just curious. Grapefruits, uh, all kinds of things. In fact, they have a baseball league down there called the baseball, the Grapefruit League, because of that. Okay, grapefruits. Get, uh, what else? Yeah, lots of lots of uh, produce, vegetables, a lot of fresh produce. Exactly. I think meat also, right? Lots of meat, lots of meat. But that <laughs> okay. comes from Chicago eventually, <laughs> or I guess some of the other uh, slaughterhouses. From Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's 74 Fahrenheit, 23C, and uh, similarly gorgeous weather here. Yeah, and I was dying to jump in and say beef. That's what we get from Texas. We, don't get, any, we don't get anything from Western Massachusetts, right? Oh, you get apples. You get yeah. um, That's yeah, right. You get maple syrup. Uh, True. We've got some of that in the area. We uh, uh, a lot of a lot of little artisanal and hobby farm uh, type gourmet foods and. That's right. That's corn. Right. They raise a lot of corn in Western. They, they do raise some corn. Yeah. And from New York City, Amy Rosenfeld. Oh. Hello. You got nothing from my lab. <laughs> <laughs> no, you get results. <laughs> you're not, well, you're not uh, doing lab-grown meat? Or, uh, <laughs> but you uh, live in New York State, which provides things, right? Yeah. Like? Sure, if you want to consider New York City, New York State, sure. Yeah, we it's part of New York well, yeah, State. I mean, New York produces great wine. <laughs> wine, apples. Yeah, the Finger Lake. Peaches, grapes. Oh, no, Long Island, too. Yeah, the Long Island wine is no good. Oh, I don't think so. I think Duck Walk is really good. I really? like Duck Walk. Yeah, I do. All right. I'll try it out. Right, well, just send the wine directly to me. I exactly. would prefer red. I do prefer red. I take cases. Oh, you know. really? You were a and, and there's I that you were most, another kind of doctor. There's that most famous New York wine. Why aren't there any good bagels around here? <laughs> exactly right. Whatever happened to us? So, Rich, today hey, is hey, you, hey. today is your day, Rich. You bet. Today is smallpox vaccination day. Yes. On, on this day in 1796, Edward Jenner uh, inoculated 12-year-old James Phipps with material from the hand of a milkmaid, Sarah Nelms, who had a cowpox infection. Uh, and six weeks later, challenged him with smallpox using a variolation technique and uh, proved their by that James <laughs> was protected. So did, did, what's that? 1796, that's 224 years ago. And, and by the way, it, Jenner followed the standard IRB approval procedures of his day. That's Absolutely. correct. That's right. His mother said to go ahead. <laughs> his mother said it was okay. Yes. <laughs> did you see so the special you know. on uh, television uh, on PBS about vaccination? I heard about it, but I did not see it. 
It was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, I should look that up and because uh, we can stream that stuff. And, that was uh, not my pick of the week. Look. I've, heard it, I've heard it was very good. It anyway, was there's, a, there's a link, a History Channel link to this, and we can put it in the show notes. And they showed how they did it in the old days. They used a knife. They made a slit in your skin, and then they took the pus from a healing smallpox victim, right. and they dipped the tip of the knife in, and they smeared it like they were frosting a cake. It was totally different than what I expected, but uh, yeah. apparently it worked <laughs> out okay. <laughs> uh, well, there were um, uh, there was variation in the technique and variation in the results. Right. Some variolators had a much lower uh, 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 adverse effect ratio right. than right. Uh, than others, and uh, the speculation is that it had to do yeah. with exactly how you did it. And in particular, how deep you made that incision. That's all true. And then, and then they showed where they um, split a sewing needle, the eye of a sewing needle. They actually uh, made a gap in the top of the sewing needle. And the uh, meniscus of that gap, I forget which size needle, but of course that's important, <clears throat> dipped into the same solution gives a, an absolutely perfect dose of this. And so they showed them using this to very light. Uh, that's interesting. That's kind of the precursor of the bifurcated needle. Exactly. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly. What do you right. got there? Oh, that's Jenner's inquiry. Yeah. Yes. Very cool. I don't know where somebody gave this to me, but. I did. <laughs> That's not a. No, I gave edition. it to you. That 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 is a fantastic book. It's from the uh, Columbia Institute of Public Health, and it's got pictures of. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Things that's like right. that. No, that's a great yeah. book. Sarah that's Nell's great hand. Book. Yeah, it's a great book. Cool. And this is a reproduction, Dixon. Right? It's not the original. There's only about uh, well, uh, like a half a dozen. I, I kept the original for myself. <laughs> if, if, you, if you had the original, I don't think you'd be flipping through the pages like that. No. Price uh, seven shillings. Six pence. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And it was originally printed in 1798. An inquiry into the causes and effects of the variole vaccinae, a disease discovered in some of the Western countries of England, particularly Gloucestershire, and known by the name of the cowpox. Wow, what a title. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and there's uh, a um, there's a TWIV episode. Uh, was that the Invincible TWIV? I think that was the Invincible episode. Rich and, and it was Rich you and, and me. I and I think this. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe even Dixon was there. I I, I can't it's recall. Possible. It's and possible. all the letters have Fs. You know, well, what's with that? Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's a uh, yeah. Old English. Old English. The, devi the, the deviation of man from the fate in which he was originally placed by nature. <laughs> uh, no, not fate. Fate. <laughs> deems to have seems to have pr proved him a prolific force of diseases. I have right. to translate all the F's into S's. That's right. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. All right. Well, happy yeah. uh, smallpox vaccination day. Are we going to have a, a COVID vaccination day one day? Uh, interesting thought. Should. Well, on that note, um, <clears throat> my 15-year-old daughter got her, her first Pfizer dose yesterday because the That's approval, great. the Massachusetts, you know, followed the CDC recommendation. Very on, good. Uh, Fantastic. What was it? Uh, Wednesday night. And I, I tried, but there were no vaccination sites open on Wednesday night. So uh, it's pretty good, though. Ah, great. Got it to her great. on Thursday. Great. Because they're all wearing your masks. Hey, good. <laughs> we're going to have a mask. Oh, we're all good. Everybody. What's that, Dixon? Are we going to have a mask burning ceremony? No. Well, no, yeah, I, that's the uh, other story I wanted to mention. Yeah. The CDC uh, says. Wait, what, what, one, one thing. Yep. Pardon me. Go ahead. <clears throat> TWIV 170. 170. Uh -huh. February 12th, 2012. And who was on it? Uh, Alan, me, and you, Dixon. <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> and we went over the inquiry. <laughs> nice. There you cool. go. Oh, that book cool. I just had, you went over that. That's yeah. right. We went. Cool. We, that was yeah. our paper for TWIV. All right. That's so there right. you go, folks. <laughs> go back and listen. I know that a lot of you don't go back. And there are a lot of good episodes. It's a different world back in those episodes. I'll say. It is. I'll say. Uh, yes, the CDC now says if you're fully vaccinated, you can resume activities that you did prior to the pandemic. I'm doing the same thing that I did before, but... <laughs> <laughs> Fully vaccinated people can resume activities without a mask or distancing, except where required by laws. Right. And of course, healthcare workers uh, can't do that either. Yeah, yeah. So you could be outside without a mask, right? You could be indoors without a mask. a mask. That's right. 
And so now everybody's sitting around saying, what were the activities I did before the pandemic? Right. That's right. What restaurants? There aren't any left open. <laughs> I still wear a mask outside and inside because uh, I, well, I, said, I don't think you, enough you people are vaccinated. And no vaccine is 100% effective, well, and, you know? And this is, um, this is also varying state by state and place by place. Private businesses can still have whatever requirements. Um, so right. I don't expect to be walking to the grocery store without a mask anytime and soon. Public transportation. What's, uh, um, what's the rule here in New York, Amy? Do we have to wear masks or? No. Uh, I don't know, actually. Um, do you wear masks I outside? I do. I do. Um, but I've seen a lot, a lot more maskless people outside walking oh, around. They were more um, concerned about outs, uh, inside than outside. Yes, inside yeah. is the bigger deal. Um, but since the CDC's recommendation, I haven't been downtown, so I don't, I don't know. It'll be interesting this afternoon when I go. Right. Um, so, if, for example, you go to a place to exercise, you have to wear a mask in there. You think or no? Well, I just go to change my clothes and then I run through Central Park. So um, I don't I don't know I'll, I'll go and see. Um, I thought you went on a treadmill somewhere. Yeah, I'm supposed to, but I don't. <laughs> actually, <Okay. laughs> uh, actually, that's a really good question. I wonder um, I wonder gyms. what the impact yeah. of gyms. Yeah. yeah, right, right. Well, gyms were not listed as one of the places. Right. So that's neither right. were that's like right. hair salons or nail salons or any of that stuff. And that is, again, going to be business dependent. So yeah. I'm sure a lot of gyms, um, I know the one that I'm a member of is still requiring appointments and masks and, and sure. all that and probably will be for some time. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it all probably also depends on the economics of the gym, like how much their membership has exactly. decreased and how much it's come back in certain things. Whether they're even still in existence. Yeah. Oh, true. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you, like, I've seen a lot of restaurants that have gone out of business that were, you know, high end restaurants and stuff. Absolutely. What about um, low end restaurants? They actually did better. Yeah, I was actually a, a few weeks ago. I was uh, for an article. I was talking to um, uh, the one of the the data guys at the the NRA, the National Restaurant Association, <laughs> um, in DC, and he, he was talking about how the the industry is so so many different things and and restaurants that were um, what was he what was it he called it uh, quick service um, have been doing great. Yeah. You know, that's your local takeout place and your fast food right. and, and right. they're doing a booming business because everybody's at home and that's eating right. takeout. Um, but the high end restaurants that Amy just mentioned, <laughs> those have been absolutely clobbered because the place that you would go with a wine list and a tablecloth, you know, and everything, <laughs> you're not going to get takeout from there, honestly. Yeah. That's um, right. Well, even so, a lot of them um, decided it wasn't worth yeah. them doing like a Grubhub or right. something or other. It wasn't worth it. And then um, I know somebody who is a waiter, but he's a guest star or continuing guest star on Succession. Oh, does that does that sound like a show? It's. I think I've <laughs> heard of that. Well, I don't have enough time to watch television, so I I, don't, I watch very little of it. I don't know. But why I think it's a popular show on HBO or something. Or okay. Anyway, he was he was like they tried to open and have you know. Grubhub and outdoor dining, and then they did the economics. They brought out the big button calculator, and then they realized that it was not worth it, and so yeah. they closed. And then um, I would say about two months ago, when it was like, okay, we're going to open, and you know, the CDC and the F NIH kind of gave the impression that there was no going back, like we weren't going to shut down anymore. Um, they finally opened and I think that they're only at like 33 per capacity and it's still yeah, like that's borderline. Right, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And the sporting Especially, arenas are at half capacity now. Yeah. Well, you have to factor in like when you're a sporting arena, the concession people, the yeah, parking right. garage people, right. the right. ticket takers, the yep. people in the ticket booth, the people who work the lights for this, you know, that go on sure. when they announce the stars and, it's yeah. a big entourage. Oh, yeah. 
I mean, just cutting, people were debating about whether or not, you know, going to a baseball stadium, the grass would be cut or not because oh, you have to have. It's being cut. Trust well, me. Well, yeah. I, I watched but the was it worth it? <laughs> yeah. I, I could cut it. I cut my grass. There you go. <laughs> Looks pretty good. Yep. I mean, we had a plumber come last week and he said, I'm sorry, I have to wreck your nice lawn. Well, oh. at least he said it was nice. <laughs> No. All right. Nice. Finally, uh, don't forget the vaccine education town halls from ASV, asv.org slash education. You could sign up to do a, a Zoom with a couple of uh, virologists and ask them about vaccines. Check it out. We have a follow-up letter from Ron Fouchier, a virologist who's one of the authors of I don't know. Did we do this paper two weeks ago, right? I think it was two weeks ago. Last week. It was last week, the ferret paper. So I think it was last week. Influenza transmission in ferrets. And he um, he is the one of the senior virologists over at the Erasmus Medical Center. And he writes, thanks for discussing, discussing our paper on flu airborne transmission between ferrets. Very nice. One correction, one of your co-hosts, Alan, question mark, made a remark that the controversy around our H5N1 work got started due to authors' comments to the press. This is an error. The controversy got started when science sent our paper to the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, NSABB, while it was under review, triggered by one of the reviewers. I, I didn't know that. The NSABB, chaired by Mike Osterholm, decided that our paper could not be published. We were not even allowed to say a word. Then the New York Times blew up the story, quote, an engineered doomsday, unquote, guided by scientists like Osterholm, Ebright, Relman, Lipsitch, and others. We could all not respond. What did, you, what did you say? <laughs> I said all of your favorites. <laughs> hey, I was going to say that, yes. We could not respond as we were not allowed to discuss any details. It is true that Martin Enserink at Science used some quotes of me out of context in his science commentaries, but it is too simple to blame me for that as I did not put these quotes out of context. Just to set your record straight, straight with kind regards, love your twiv. And then P.S. I had a long interview with Enserink where we went through many human and animal influenza viruses that were used for our transmission research, of which H5N1 was without any doubt the most pathogenic for birds and ferrets. But this quote was not in the context we had made potentially the most dangerous virus you can create. That quote was not mine. I have been purposely misquoted several times during this episode as some press simply likes to spice things up. The only way to avoid that is to not speak to the press as Kawaoka did. The question is if that was the right thing to do. I was advised otherwise. I still do not know if that was the right thing to do, but I think so. So there you, we discussed a little bit. So there's, there's some behind the scenes. Any thoughts on this? Well, I did a I did a little Google search uh, to see if I could get some more context on this. I, actually, mostly I was looking for the Enserink article and who was quoted as saying what where, and I bumped into uh, a uh, I guess is essentially a blog post that I think we've gone over before by uh, an individual named Peter M. Sandman who uh, is a self-described expert in risk communication. Oh, yes. I know right? the name. Yes. Yes. Right. He, he actually I, wrote to us. He wrote to yeah. us. Yes. Oh, that's right. That's right. Uh, and uh, this particular post, which we could link in the show notes yes. if you want, um, goes through this in excruciating detail. And he credits his wife uh, to a large extent uh uh, for uh, doing the uh, research on this. Uh, and it is significantly more complex than <laughs> we have uh, really uh, described. And, you know, I think the bottom line is that in particular, when you're going to uh, speak publicly about potentially inflammatory subjects, you got to be really careful. Yes. All right. And that goes for everybody goes for the scientists, it goes for the news media, everybody else. And I think the safest thing to do probably is stick strictly to the facts, 
All right. Uh, but this is a, a great blog that goes through it in detail. If you yeah. want to see, actually, it's a great example of how, uh, you know, uh, uh, science communication can go wrong. Yeah. Okay. Many uh, reporters, however, goad the interviewee to go beyond the data and to speculate and give them opinions. And okay. they I keep would like repeating to, uh, that in several <laughs> different ways. And as, as the person who made the so-called error that led to this letter in the first place, I would like to jump in here for a moment. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and as the token journalist in the room. So, uh, Ron, I'm sorry, um, uh, sorry the, that my comment came off that way. And I would like to say that you are absolutely correct in... Um, Pointing, pointing the blame to the, the, the primary blame anyway to this whole NSABB process. And we actually had on the episode that, that discussed this when we finally got a hold of the paper, um, uh, we had an extensive discussion about that process and we had, um, who was it we had on who Mike, was on the NSABB? Mike Imperiali. Mike Imperiali. Uh, so if you go back, search Mike Imperiali in the TWIV archive, you'll find that episode. And we learned from him that this was a case of a whole bunch of people being pulled into a discussion that they never expected to have. And Ron, you were one of them. <laughs> and uh, Mike Imperiali was certainly one of them. The NSABB was never constituted for the purpose of doing this type of review. They were forced to do it under conditions that were absurd. Um, they you know, were basically allowed into a locked room with a copy of the paper and could read it there, but they couldn't take their notes out with them, like just this insane process. So the, the whole thing got very Kafka-esque. Um, in terms of quoting out of context, okay, so this comes up a lot in journalism. And there there is such a thing, there are journalists who will do what Dixon said and goad somebody into saying something inadvisable and then quote them on it because they're trying to make a sensational story. Um, I, I just want to step in. I, I don't personally know Martin Ensrich, but I've, I've read a lot of his work and I have a lot of respect for him. And I seriously doubt that that was his intent here. Um, I will point out that it takes two to make a miscommunication. <laughs> so if you feel that Martin quoted you out of context, probably the context that you thought you were speaking in was not the context he was hearing you in. Um, and, uh, and yeah, this, this whole thing went way out of control. I, I would like to add that there was at least one sentence in the original paper that the NSABB was reviewing that we discussed extensively on either the Mike Imperiali episode or, or another related episode right around that same time frame. And it was, Ron, it was in your paper and it was a, a horribly constructed sentence, even when read in the context of the paper that you wrote, that co communicated the risk of this experiment very, very badly. Um, so I, I do apologize for acting as if you were the primary source of, of the problem. You were not. The whole, the whole process was the problem. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of blame to go around here. By, by the way, um, so... Talking about this reporting process, um, I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but I was on Fox News the other day. Did you know that? Oh, no. I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a regular yeah, viewer, sorry. Unsolicited. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, I, I missed that episode. Tell, I watch should, it all the time. <laughs> you should tell the story that you actually didn't know it was Fox right. News when you so agreed they, they played a, to be on. No, no, I'm not talking about the radio show. I'm talking about oh. they played a clip of an interview, a TWIV that I had done with Peter Daszak back in December 2019 in Singapore. And uh, then, what's the guy's name? Tucker Carlson, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Tucker, you got number one. So he <laughs> used this as evidence that the virus was manufactured in a lab, okay? And what, what das I said to Daszak, what, what can we do to look at the pandemic potential of bat- SARS like coronaviruses. Remember, this is before SARS CoV 2. And he said, Well, what Barrick is doing is, you know, we get the spike sequences from bat isolates and we bring them in the lab and we, we substitute them into viruses, bat viruses in the lab where we have the whole genome. And then we see if they infect human cells. And there you know whether they have pandemic potential or not. And so, so, so Carlson played that clip and said, See, they made it in the lab. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen that. Uh, I've seen that particular interview abused 
uh, on numerous yes. platforms because it's actually very interesting to listen to that interview. And if you don't know the science sure. and you listen to that interview, it sounds horrifying. Yes. Okay. But if you do know the science, it's perfectly reasonable experiments uh, yeah. for, for perfectly reasonable <laughs> objectives. But even just listening right now to the way he describes it, yeah. it's not exact. You could walk away thinking that it's yeah. bad because he just yeah. said you put the spike gene into the genome. Sure. Yes. Well, I justified. That's I not said, exactly what. No, that's not exactly what they do. Of course they it is. have. a. Yes, but it's not the it's not like a SARS. G, it's not a SARS genome. No, it's a bad I virus. Believe. Right. Yeah. I, I believe, it, or it's an alpha corona or something or other. I forget all the details, but it's not like they cloned it out and they put it into the genome of of yeah. some dangerous virus, which no, is no, kind right. of the implication, which without all of the details and the just saying, oh, they put it into the genome where the four of us understand. Yeah. Right. The lay got, public got doesn't understand what that means. And they walk away thinking, oh my God, they put it back into the genome and they unleashed this. Okay. Well, well, you need, there are five of us, Amy, and I did understand that also. So the, the, I did. I counted you. I just didn't count myself, Dixon. I agree. I'm saying it. I agree. The four I think, of us. Uh, the four of you. Yeah. Okay, I just okay, didn't okay, count okay, myself. Okay. It, it could be clear, but the, what you should do in that case is to come to me and ask me. So a reporter yesterday, I forgot where he's from, he wrote and he said, I just saw this interview. And for what I, wanted to, for what I understand, he said, I'm not a scientist, but they they put this they made this virus in a lab and he says to me do you have any idea why they would do such a thing <laughs> <laughs> so i wrote i said of course i have an idea i've been doing viruses yeah. for 40 years for god's sake <laughs> so i explained it to him he goes oh that makes perfect sense um and <laughs> then i get an email today from someone else i know who he wrote to verify what i said <laughs> i guess that's standard right alan a fact check. That's a fine thing to do. Yeah, and I will. I, I would like to point out to uh, to Ron and any other scientists who are curious about this this whole process of talking to journalists. Um, you can ask for a readback. You can yeah. ask. You you can say, "Look, I'll I'll talk to you, but I'd like to see before the article goes to press. I'd like to see the quotes of mine that you're going to use. Right. And right. at least the sentence in which you're going to use them. Um, and on that condition, I'll speak to you. And Every reputable journalist that I know will agree to that. You know, I certainly yeah. will. I say, yeah, sure. sure. Um, what they won't do is send you a copy of the entire article because that gets into a whole thicket of problems that that we don't even want to open. But um, but sending just the quotes, you know, I'm going to quote you saying this. Is this accurate? And that's fine. And and that's something journalists who are doing their job right should be interested in. We want we actually do want to get the story straight. Yeah, most people. Yeah, so actually, in his in his letter, Ron uh, uh, rhetorically asked the question: Do we talk to journalists or not? Right. And I think yeah. the answer is yes. Yes. Okay, but you do so uh, with a certain understanding of uh, kind of what the rules are and how you should do it and how to avoid screw ups. And as I've as I've told researchers, I've uh, years ago I, I gave some talks about talking to the press because. People were interested in this. Um, and you, you, when you're talking to a reporter, they are not your enemy, but they're also not your colleague. <laughs> so you're not just you're not just having a beer with somebody from your lab and chit chatting. You, you have to bear in mind that you're basically on an open mic, which I think people have a greater appreciation of now yeah, yeah. in the Zoom era than maybe they did um, That's a good a point. years ago. That's a good point. I like that. So point. basically, the way, you should stay to the script. You should don't stick to the... Don't deviate. Uh, stick to the facts, yes. yes. Stick to the facts. Twiv That's 180... the facts, man. Isn't Twiv 180... Uh, no, actually, yes. That's uh, Sergeant Joe Friday. Yes. Except he never actually said that, apparently. <laughs> oh, I've looked I it up know. several times. <laughs> right. But I don't care because it makes a good... It, it's a better a good quote, quote, Yes. Uh, TWIV 182, 182 May 6, 2012, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, as in F, uh, I'm sorry, one flew, flew FLU over, over the ferret's the nest. The ferret's nest, yes. Uh, Vincent, me, Alan, and Michael Imperiali. There we go. Uh, where you get Michael's inside story on what uh, goes on in the NSABB. 
Yeah, folks, we got 755 archival twibs. Some of them are really interesting. You ought to go back. I know people don't go back, but hey, there's some good stuff back there. Yeah. Okie dokie. Um, Yes, Alan, most of the reporters I talk to offer to show me, and they send a link to the article uh, before it's okay. published to say, make sure it's okay. And others do not, but I could ask them, right? Yeah. Yeah. And what I'll do, what I do as, as standard practice, as soon as anybody asks, well, can I see on me a quote? Sure. I will send you any paragraph in which I'm quoting you, yeah. which may be a little more generous than some people would do, but I feel like the paragraph is the context. Yeah, where they quote you, that's fine. Yeah. The other thing I've noticed is that um, some writers, where they have more time, they actually have a, fa a separate fact checker who will yes. call me and go through. Yes. And others, of course, need it out tomorrow so they don't do any fact checking. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so, monthly monthly publications and web publications that are not on an hourly yeah. clock uh, will frequently have somebody a separate doing the fact check. It's more difficult, though, when you're being interviewed by someone who doesn't speak English as their native language, like Korean, for instance, and they'll promise to send you the article. And they do. Uh, and then I, <laughs> then I say, gee, I can't even find my name in this article, you know. Right. It's right. interesting that okay. way. All right. I, have, I wanted to quickly uh, discuss a uh, paper that's been published, which we discussed a while ago as a preprint on TWIV 696. And this from uh, the laboratory of Rudolf Janisch at MIT. Uh, it's finally published in PNAS, reverse transcribed SARS-CoV-2 RNA can integrate into the genome of cultured human cells and can be expressed in patient-derived tissues. So we had done, done it as a preprint and found it lacking in- uh, I found it wanting. <laughs> convincing data, actually. So there are two things here. First, they took RNA sequence data from patient samples. And they said, oh, look, there's some sequences where the viral sequence is joined to human cellular sequence, right? In one read. And so this must be because, maybe it's because the RNA was converted to DNA and integrated into the cell, and now it's being transcribed from the cellular genome. So it's, it's joined to some neighboring which is one way you could get that product. Yeah, and most yes. likely though, the real way that you get that product is you didn't use the right algorithm when you programmed your computer to do the bioinformatics for yeah. the sequencing. That's, yes, and so when that paper you know, was published and all of a sudden there was a storm of bioinformaticians saying, oh, this is a sequence artifact. We see this all the time in library yeah. preparation and so forth. And so this paper comes out, and then just yesterday, a JV paper uh, comes out, um, which basically says, yeah, they're, the sequences are, are artifacts. These joins happen. What's the name of this one? Uh, I don't have it up here. Um, Most virus chimeric events in SARS-CoV-2 infected cells are infrequent and artifactual. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, okay, so... That's one part of the paper. And now the thing is that the manuscript has been changed. The PNAS manuscript has been slightly changed. And they actually say in the results section, they say, uh, here we'll, here's what we find, these chimeric transcripts. But, you know, we, we know they could be artifacts, which they didn't say last time. <laughs> but now they say we, ex we know that they could be artifactual. But here's what we found. You know, this virus is a plus strand in RNA genome. And when it reproduces, it goes through a negative strand intermediate. And you know, there's about a thousand times less negative strands in an infected cell than a plus strand of this virus. Yet in our reads of our transcripts, boy, we see a lot of negative strands. So that must mean that it's not an artifact. To which I say, how, how can you say that? Because when you make a plus strand DNA, then you make a minus strand. So how do you know which one was copied? Am I thinking well, wrong, folks? <laughs> no, but the other thing is, is that they look, it's specific to an RNA. It's specific to nucleocapsid. Nucleocapsid is a subgenomic RNA. You have to come off of the negative strand. So you have to, it's transcribed independently of the rest of the genome, right? Right. 
So it's not surprising. So it's not surprising that the ratio may be not the same as for the full length genome that's replicating, right? Sure. Sure. But I they mean, don't factor that in at all. No. And once you make once you go to sequence or whatever, you make a library, you can't really discern what, what strand you came from. I agree. So that's the bottom line. I don't see how they can tell what strand was reverse transcribed from this. And so it's still, in my view, likely to be artifactual or prone to artifacts. And that's really the only part of the paper that's useful. The other part, they take a cell line. So the idea here is that our cells contain reverse transcriptase in the form of Elements in our genome called line elements, L-I-N-E. stands for long interspersed nuclear elements. And these actually move around the genome by virtue of reverse transcription. And the, the idea is they could, any incoming RNA into the nucleus line could reverse transcribe it and then it could integrate. So they actually have a cell line that overproduces line. They infect it with SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> yeah, you're going to make SARS-CoV-2 DNA and some of it integrates. It doesn't mean anything. We know these events happen. That's nothing. So I'm not convinced at all that this happens in patients. Uh, you know, most cells, as far as I can tell, in an infected patient are killed by virus, by SARS-CoV-2. They'd like to say, oh, maybe this explains why some people are PCR positive for a long time. No. It's, in virology, we're, we're beginning to understand that RNA viruses hang around for a while. And they don't have to become DNAs to do that. So... I'm still very unhappy with this paper. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah, I, I, want to, I want to add one minor clarification on what you said about line elements. You said they uh, move around. Um, I would qualify that by saying they move around on an evolutionary scale. Yeah. Okay? Right. This is, uh, Not on a daily this, scale. It, yeah. <laughs> okay. Because people are going to be freaking out about, you know, oh, man, I'm full of reverse transcriptase. And so any RNA I encounter is going to get reverse transcribed and stuffed in the genome. Well, you know, give it, you know, 500 million years and maybe yeah. so. Okay. Yeah. But uh, th this is a very infrequent event. It happens and it's there, but it's extremely infrequent. But RT is also really, like, it's really hard to detect. Yes, it's very low. You, yes. uh, it's beyond very low. I mean, yeah, you I agree. sneeze, you don't do anything, you 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 don't do the prep properly, whatever. I mean, it's gone. Yeah, I agree. And so, I mean, yeah, it's nothing. So I just think this really has no relevance to the pathogenesis of COVID. And it's unfortunate, you know, PNAS is a rather prominent journal. However... In the past, not so good papers have been published there as well. Wouldn't uh, we agree? <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's because of the back door. Yeah. Right. And right. Yanish is a, is a member of the National Academy, and you see this is contributed by Rudolf Yanish. And so the deal here, for people who are not aware, uh, Proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences is a prestigious journal, publishes a lot of very high-impact, high-profile papers, has a rigorous peer review process. It's hard to get your paper into it unless... You are a member of the National Academy of Sciences, which is this um, sort of self-electing honor society uh, in science, um, rarefied. Uh, it, it would it would have been keep accurate dancing, to keep dancing, keep dancing. It would have been accurate to call it a bo <laughs> an old boys club for a long period of its existence. So it's um, uh, if you're a member of that rarefied group, you can put it. It used to be you could pretty much just get access to the printing press they did they did implement some adult supervision <laughs> i <I'd> like um, that <laughs> some years ago so now do you see this was reviewed by a couple of people um so there is a process but it's a much much lower <laughs> bar for somebody like yanish to get a paper in there than it is for somebody like you know ordinary mortals to do that yeah i wanna i don't think it's just the pathogenesis Vincent, that this has no role in there's no role in the biology of the virus right yeah Agreed. It has Ex no role in the family of the virus. Extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. And the evidence of this extraordinary claim of a positive strand RNA virus that lives entirely in the cytoplasm somehow getting integrated as DNA into the host genome, um, that's, that's extraordinary. And the evidence here is just not. I mean, you may argue, well, let's put this out there and see if people can confirm it, right? Okay, then don't put it no, in a high-profile journal then, right? No, that's what theory journals are for. <laughs> I was going to say, that's not, what, that's not what biologists do. No. It, this is done to like, 
you know, either give your postdoc a paper to show that you're in the field and get a grant or something or other. This is, or to stroke your ego and say, oh, I can move fields from field to field. Cause he's not a virologist. He's like, what, a, a developmental stem cell bi- guy. Yeah. Mouse developmental biology. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really you have no, okay. you have no place to have been doing this work. Yeah, like but you're people, not. But I, I know, I know what you mean. Bandwagging Amy, is not appropriate. I, mean, I think people can try other fields, but they have to do the right experiments, right? Well, then get a virologist on the paper. Correct. <laughs> that's not a bad idea. Yeah, that's yeah not a bad go idea. talk to a coronavirologist and have them. There's plenty out there. There's plenty of people who are virologists who are posing as coronavirologists who would like a paper. So you could, I'm sure you could dial 1-800-virologist and find them. <laughs> There's too many ASV. letters. Org slash education. Oh, no, that's the, sorry. <laughs> okay, enough of that. Um I wanted to discuss a uh, follow-up to last week where we talked about, you know, lab uh, releases of uh, poliovirus in the post-eradication error. And um, th- these are a pair of papers where basically a new uh, derivative of the uh, existing type 2 Sabin oral poliovirus vaccine has been produced in the laboratory and then gone through a phase one in people. And just to remind you, so we have three serotypes of poliovirus that cause paralysis. Types one and three have been declared eradicated. Uh, Type two, um, sorry, types two and three have been declared eradicated. And type one is the only wild virus that still circulates in Pakistan and Afghanistan, you know, uh, 200 cases in the last 12 months. The problem is there have been over 400 cases of vaccine-derived poliovirus type 2 in in many countries. And this is because the the viruses, when you take them orally, they reproduce in your gut. They immunize you, but they also revert so that when shed, they could infect someone who's not immunized and cause polio. And in fact, countries where immunization coverage drops, you have outbreaks caused by the vaccine. And that's the main issue now. So that's why uh, I think it was 2016, right, Alan, the WHO said, we're now no longer using the type 2 component of OPV. Right. And we recommend you start with a trivalent IPV, inactivated polio vaccine first. But these type 2 vaccine-derived polioviruses have continued to circulate, and they've caused outbreaks in the years that we've even stopped using uh, OPV2 because they're in the population. And the problem that arises then is because you've stopped using uh, type 2 in the vaccine, now you're building up a pool of people who are not immunized against type 2, and you've got vaccine-derived type 2 circulating, so you could potentially get into big trouble here in, in short and order. And usually what they do to control these outbreaks is to go in with monovalent type 2 OPV, which starts the whole cycle starts over. Starts the whole cycle again, right? yes. Okay, so the papers today are the solution, uh, theoretically the solution. A solution. A solution. Uh, one, one would be, of course, to shift entirely to IPV, but I don't know how long those Type 2 OPVs are going to keep <laughs> circulating, right? Just, as I said, just keep giving IPV because you need the infrastructure for injected vaccines anyway. But the WHO is is in a tight spot with this. And so, yeah. So the, the first is a cell host microbe paper. I want to give a big picture view with color commentary, of course. <laughs> um, engineering the live attenuated polio vaccine to prevent reversion to virulence uh, by uh, Ye, Bujaki, Dolan, Smith, Wahid, Kahn's Wiener, Bandiopathy, uh, Van Damme, De Coster, Revitz, Andrew McAdam, and Raul Landino um, from UCSF, University of San Fran- California, San Francisco, the National Institutes for Biological Standards and Control, Center for Vaccine Innovation and, and uh, Access in Seattle. The Gates Foundation funded a lot of this and the University of Antwerp. They're very interested in this sort of thing. And I really like this paper because they leverage years of studies on the molecular biology of of poliovirus and other procornaviruses to to modify the virus. I think it's so cool. This is a really great, here's why you do basic research on a a virus, even after you've got multiple effective vaccines, um, you know, and they just take, they take that science and they just bring it all to bear on making this thing. So the starting point is we know 
for all the three vaccine uh, OPV strains, but for type two in this case, in the five prime non-coding region, there's a stem loop where there's a single base change that's absolutely essential for the reduction of, of neurovirulence. We call attenuation of neurovirulence. And that change reverts in the gut when you get the vaccine. And, and what happens is it's a single base change uh, at 481, an A to G change that therm it decreases the stability of this stem loop. So there's an RNA stem loop. Excuse me, I don't know if people in general know what that is, but RNA, you know, is you typically view it as a linear strand, can base pair with itself and make stem loops. Uh, and think of it like packing tape. Packing tape. Okay. It could just stick. Yeah, to when itself. it folds back on itself, what yeah. a okay. drag. Okay. What <laughs> a drag. <laughs> then you have to cut it and throw it out, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so there's a single change in one of these stem loops and destabilizes the stem loop, and that makes the virus more virulent. We've known this for years. I had a student work on this ages ago, Eric Moss. Yeah, I remember Eric. I remember Eric. And other people have done it as well, and including Adam McAdam and Phil Miner, Jeff Almond. It's so old school polio research. Anyway, so they said, let's stabilize this general area of this stem loop. So they introduced a number of changes at the chain, at this particular site and, and near to it, I forgot the total numbers, but a, a bunch of changes. And this was actually done in the context of another serotype of polio, but they take a, this piece. This has got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 changes to stabilize the loop, right? And they, they substitute it into um, the genome of the type two strain. And they show at least in cell culture, it looks like this makes it genetically more stable. So that's one change. Uh, so I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so I read this paper and my uh, th this is not going to be color commentary. This is going to be mostly color questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So this is, this stem loop, am I correct, that it is part of, if not all of the internal ribosome entry site, Right. As part of it. Yeah. So that's yeah. where, so that's where, uh, presumably, this structure is uh, part of the requirement to basically initiate the infection with ribosomes binding here and starting to translate. Right. Is it understood uh, why it is? What's the association between uh, the stability of that loop and neurovirulence? The the, the stability of the loop correlates. Um, with attenuation. So the more stable the loop is, the less neurovirulent. So the mutation destabilizes the loop and it makes it neurovirulent. I think Rich is getting at how does that happen? Oh, yeah. you want a mechanism. You yeah. want a mechanism. Now, I mean, we always <laughs> like thought how does it, a ribosome, how does a ribosome yeah. landing? So we have an association, but not in a mechanism. We don't have right? a mechanism. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it probably involves translation to some extent, right, Amy? Yeah, I think it enhances the amount of protein. You can, it facilitates, it allows more ribosomes to uh, bind more efficiently. Probably. Yeah. It, it doesn't necessarily influence tropism, no. right? Well, but no, rather just overall speaks. replication. Yeah. No, there's yeah. a reference right, here uh, to Cowder and Rack and Yellow 2004. And there we showed the tropism is not affected. No. Okay. But yeah, yeah I think. I mean, that was your whole hypothesis was from Rosa's work was that when you, I believe when you did that IP with um, the RNA, yeah. right? From Rosa with Saul and you saw, you saw a band at what? 53 kilodaltons from HeLa cells, but not from neuroblastoma cell lines. Then you hypothesized that it was because that this, there was some protein that was unable to bind yeah. because the structure wasn't right. Right. Yeah, and then, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. then when, and then when Cowder was defending, I think like six months before Cowder was defending was Nomoto's paper that took out the interferon receptor. Yeah, and that showed that it was the interferon that it was all host dependent. That Tropism is all host dependent. Yeah, so polio yeah. is restricted to certain tissues, but if you take out the interferon type one system, then the virus can grow wherever there is a receptor. So yes, Rich, the idea would be that you reduce the amount of protein made, viral protein, you get less virus, you get less neurovirulence. And these right. mutations, the reverting mutations increase 
protein synthesis. Right. So the, right. it makes it faster. They right. stabilize this stem loop with a bunch of mutations. They show in cell culture that looks like it's working, but that's not the only thing they did. And that's what's cool about this paper. So you could make a really stable stem loop, but these viruses recombine like mad in your intestine. And there are lots of other enteroviruses in your intestine at any given time that could swap out this lovely genetically modified five prime end and just say, Psh, here I am, I'm neurovirulent again. So they wanted to somehow prevent that. And they did well, it. You have to be a C to have recombination. Sorry? You have to be an enter. You have to be an entero C to yeah, have Yeah, but we have lots of entero Cs in us, right? Co-circulating enterovirus mm, C species. Not so much. That's what they say, co-circulating enterovirus C species. Okay. All right, so um, there is another stem loop downstream on the viral genome in the capsid coding region. It's called the Cree element. It's essential for RNA synthesis. We won't get into the mechanism. But you can move it around as long as you maintain the amino acid sequence, right? So they move it right next to this five prime stem loop, right? Where they've introduced these stabilizing changes with the idea that if we, if it gets recombined out of- If you recombine, you die. You die, yes. you will replicate. It's a kind of a neat strategy, right? It's a, it's a very clever move. And it seems to prevent recombination. Um, they, they actually test that with a, with a couple of different viruses. So that's number two. And then the third is they modify the RNA polymerase of the virus. The, vir the RNA polymerase, of course, copies the RNA genome. And they select for variants of the polymerase with two new properties. They make fewer errors and they recombine less. So again, the chance that that five prime end change is going to revert is even reduced more by making the polymerase more uh, have higher fidelity, and then the polymerase also combines the uh, controls the recombination, and they select for a variant that recombines less. And they have a variety of assays they use to assay this. It's very lovely if you're into the molecular biology, uh, but in the end, they make what do they call it a high fi <laughs> polymerase, right? And they stick that in. So now we have three changes. We have a more stable stem loop. We moved the Cree element. We have a polymerase with uh, makes less errors and less recombination. I'm actually amazed that this was allowed to be put into people, right? With all this <laughs> modification. But, well, I mean, it's still, it's OPV. It is right? OPV. And, and in done, fact. And, and they've done their homework on on seeing what this can replicate in, what it can't. Um, and when we look at the clinical trials, let's, yeah. let's save that for the clinical yeah. trials because it is an interesting point. They took yes. numerous appropriate precautions. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Very interesting precautions. So, so yes. this virus now that they've made, they wanna know if it is more genetically stable uh, than the parent virus. So they do serial passages which is known for Sabin after one passage, boom, it reverts. That's amazing. But this virus takes, well, you never see the reversion of the 481 change. They get changes elsewhere, but then they put those changes into uh, viruses with those changes into transgenic mice. And, you know, they're not, they're not neurovirulent in, in the mice. So this virus seems to be genetically stable, at least in cell culture. It's attenuated in a mouse model. They looked to see if it would rec recombine with other enteroviruses. They actually did some co-infections with, I think, type three poliovirus. Yes. Um, they didn't use any entero other entero Cs, right, Amy? No. Would have been nice they, to do that, right? They didn't use any entero Cs. But the entero Cs that you were referring to yeah. before are not in your gut. They're just circulating in the environment. In the environment. So where are That's they going to recombine then, uh, Amy? That's different. It's not clear. It's not clear how much actual, you know, okay, what so they're recombining. Here's though. what I Although remember. It's known from past studies that yeah. I believe that periodically there is a recombination event between Coxsackie and it. And it and a polio, like when you look at like some of the stool samples from 
outbreaks in Africa. Well, but, if you, if you uh, take, if you immunize someone with OPV and you collect their stool, the viruses after a few days are all recombinants where the three prime end has been exchanged with an enterovirus, a non-polio enterovirus. Okay, it happens all the time. And that's why I, that's, I don't know if they're enterovirus Cs or something else, but well, you, the, you get recombination in the human gut during vaccination for sure. Could be, but according to Barton's work, you can only have within entero A's and you know, might be, they don't go across yeah, the, species. I'm talking about old literature, 20 years old, but anyway. So in this, what I what I got from this um, with using type three as their recombination partner is that that's one you know is going to be compatible, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you, yes. it's like maximize your chance of that's recombination. Right. Give it the ideal recombination partner and see if you can get it to recombine. And but if that were true, so I could argue why you didn't use type one. Why is that? Because okay. type one's the one that's circulating. So right. why would you use one that is on the border that on the border of being eradicated and not use the one that you know is still wild that cir I don't know. circulating wild type. So it's either type two and type three more frequently recombine and one does not or so something they, around there. So they use but, type three and then they say after five rounds of co-infection and selection, no, no, no recombination of the five prime end of type three. Right. right. Yeah. Um, they do some. Well, I think recombination generally, the mechanism is you only you you retain the five prime end in the capsid regions. You exchange the, the three prime end. That's proteins. right. They didn't see that at so all. So therefore, you wouldn't find a recombinant with three prime end, with the five prime end. Well, you would see. Oh, you're saying the capsid would be separated from the uh, five prime UTR. So it would be type three in this case? Wouldn't matter. I'm saying that the recombination crossover events are usually at the non are usually in the non-structural part. Yes, I agree with that. Nevertheless, they didn't see any recombination where they did have a control where they would see it. So this the changes yeah. they've introduced have prevented it. Uh they let's see. Um they they do some, it actually is an interesting paper because they have, they present some of the clinical trial data, which are in the other paper. So we won't go into that, but they right. do uh, immunize mice with the virus and see if the immune response is similar to the OPV, right? Because remember- yeah, so this, is their, this is their preclinical trial. It's their preclinical, because you can't do an efficacy trial with this virus because there's not enough polio in the world, right? So you're going to have to go on faith that it's safe and it's immunogenic, right? which is not what we're used to, but maybe they're going to do it. Actually, op new OPVs have been licensed in other countries based on that already, but not in the U.S. yet. So the antigenic profile seems to be the same as uh, Sabin 2. Um, and then they, they look at the, the clinical trial, which I want to reserve for the other paper. It's a separate so paper. I do, have a, uh, I do have a question about this. The clinical trial was published almost two years ago. Right. And this paper just came out. Yeah, the paper, I saw the paper, I reviewed it two years ago for a different journal. And I loved it, but apparently another reviewer didn't like it and it delayed them and they eventually had to submit it to another journal. It took huh. two years for them to get it out. Because I used to say wow. to Rollo, where's this paper? Where is this paper? He said, oh, reviewer number three is being a pain. <laughs> reviewer number three, always. So is reviewer number three. I said, this is great. No no problems. I mean, it was wonderful. There was no no issue with it. And, but So, so but that's it, why. It's it's interesting because this is the, we have run into this situation on numerous occasions where we're looking at a clinical trial or or – uh, worse yet, a uh, press release, and uh, we want to know the details, and yeah. they aren't published. Yep. And this is a situation where you know you got a clinical trial, <laughs> the trials published. with this amazing, with this amazing uh, virus, but you can't find out the details of the virus yeah, till two years right. later. So that's why I've been waiting um, to do this because I wanted to have both the paper and the clinical trial. Right. Okay. By the way, cool. I want to just mention in this paper before we move to the clinical trial. 
Um, <laughs> Amy has put in big red letters, L20 B cells. They use these cells in this paper. And L20 B cells are a cell line that my student, Kathy Mendelson, made ages ago when she had first identified the polio receptor. She took the human gene or maybe cDNA and put it into mouse L cells and made a line of mouse cells that could be infected with polio. We gave them to a lot of people and they're all over the world. Um, unfortunately, we lost ours. Uh, <laughs> A couple of years ago, due to a liquid nitrogen freezer warm up. And um, oh. so Amy recently decided she needed them and she found them at the CDC, right? Yes, I did. Um, <laughs> uh, let's not discuss it because uh, uh, the, uh, the author on the paper, um, I like a lot the last author and I. Uh, not so happy uh, with uh, somebody else on the paper. Can I say the story um, or no? Sure, as long as... No names as, be mentioned. As, I was going to say as long as um, the last author of the paper doesn't get mad at me and uh, stop talking to me. But and, anyway, yeah. so we saw this paper and they have L20B cells. So I said, Amy, I'll call the guy. And if, so they said, we don't have these cells. We never use them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Oops. obviously they did, but so I said, all right, yeah. go to the CDC. We got them from CDC. Yeah. Um, That's the yeah. story. But actually these cells are, um, they're used very uh, prominently in the field. So like today we received two viruses from the CDC that were isolated from AFM children in Africa. And they were determined to be different viruses um, from polio because immediately they take the stool and they isolate virus and they put it on L20B cells and they say, CP or no CP? Yeah, so mo only so. polio will grow on those among the enteros, right? Yeah. So um, I, mean, well, I have my own reason for why I wanted these yeah. cells and stuff. But we, they're uh, still very uh, useful in the field. We, we did something good. <laughs> 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 All right. So the other paper, the trial, is uh, in The Lancet. It was published in June 2019. The safety and immunogenicity of two novel live attenuated monovalent serotype 2 oral poliovirus vaccines in healthy adults, a double blind single center phase one study. July 2019. July 2019. The first uh, authors are Van Dam and De Koster, and the last author is Gast. And there's Raul Andino, Andrew McAdam on here, uh, people from Cara the Gates, Burns. Cara Burns, the Olin Q. So here they do a, tr a phase one trial. And one of the aspects that's very cool, right? This was done uh, in, in Belgium. They, at the University of Antwerp Hospital, they actually made a, what they called a polyopolis. Yes. <laughs> they take a, a container. Right. So the, the problem, we should, we should explain why you would do this, sure, right? I mean, you, so you're, you're gonna do a phase one trial on this engineered um, oral, pol oral polio vaccine. Um, you're going to do it in a country where everybody's vaccinated with the inactivated vaccine, so that's fine. But as we talked about before, the inactivated vaccine doesn't prevent you from acting as a carrier. So in principle, if you give this to volunteers and they, you know, go to the bathroom and their sewage goes out into the sewage mm. treatment plant, then you've just sent virus into the environment that you think is not going to revert and it's experimental um, and yeah, you hope yeah. that you don't cause a subsequent, you know, downstream outbreak with it. So they decided to just isolate their volunteers absolutely. And this is like the extreme lockdown version trial. It's like two weeks they were isolated, right? Something yeah, like so that. They, they, they built this facility um, and this is, I guess this had to have been built Oh, right. So this is happening before the pandemic. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they had they had the ability to build this, build out this floor with a bunch of individual patient rooms. And it's like a dormitory. I think it's, a fit, uh, they took a, a little container. Fitness center and it's basically a room. couple of containers. Uh, it, right. Shipping containers that they put together. Right. OK. And uh, yeah, yeah, they so stayed they, there they and, this. and monitored collecting stools, you know, every day and making sure they're OK. Um, they had their we're talking own about a total. Of, we're talking about a total of thirty people. Thirty people. Yeah. 
so one thing I, and uh, Vincent, you have a link here to the Poliopolis where this probably ought to be the, uh, the image for the episode. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, cool. But people, people can look at this. It's awesome. Um, so this is double blind, right? Yep. So yeah, the is. vaccine recipients uh, can't know who's a recipient and who's not. So the recipients and the placebo, I assume, are all together in this facility. Yeah, they are. Right? And they're all using the same bathrooms. Mm -hmm. yep. So I wondered whether there was any sort of follow-up to see whether any of these individuals, any of the placebos caught virus <laughs> from the experiments. From the experiments. Um, that's a good question. So, how, so it's not respiratory. Right. No, but you it's shed it in your stool. You shed it in your stool, so hopefully you wash your hands. My question stands. Yes. Was there a um, group that got no vaccine or did they get to two different vaccines? I think they uh, both got I, vaccination, yeah. Uh, I'd have to look uh, at what the, yeah, what the uh, control was in the trial. Yeah, the first 15 participant got one and then the rest got the other. Yeah. So they got the two. So there's actually a second OPV that we haven't discussed, which was made by um, Codon. So there's Codon. not actually uh, a placebo group. No, there isn't a placebo no. group. It's no, two it's different okay. engineered OPVs. Yeah, yeah okay. one is Codon deoptimized based off of Eckhart right. science paper. All right. Yeah. And then they have that this one by Raul and Andy. And these people were all previously polio immunized, right? I, I, IPV yes. immunized. IPV. So yeah. So to me, those are the two real precautions: the containment facility and the fact that they were also previously immunized. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I the just the first precaution: the containment facility is to protect the community, and the previous immunization is to protect the volunteers. <clears throat> so none of these people are going to get paralyzed by this virus. I put in a picture of the Polyopolis. You can see it's like thirty containers all stitched together. Right. Um, it's Looks quite an operation. Grim. It's in the parking yeah. lot, you know. It's in the parking There's lot. There's no windows. Oh, no wow. windows, and no, they've, they've got an interior. Um, uh, they can look out on a little courtyard, I think. And they have uh, gotten rid of a lot of parking spaces, so probably a lot of people were pissed off they couldn't park their car. <laughs> At least if it were where, here. Where was this? Uh, Antwerp Belgium. Hospital, Belgium. Antwerp, Belgium. Oh. Belgium. God. I hope they gave him chocolate at least. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the question is, folks, would you volunteer for this? Wow. For how uh, much? Two for weeks. A, yeah, exactly. No, 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 no. For how much? No, for how much money? <laughs> oh, how much money? I don't know. Yeah, what are we going to That's make right. They have to pay them, obviously. The price yeah. is right, maybe, but. Uh, I don't know, 50 bucks a day? Nah. It's not nah. a lot of money. Nah. But that's what they're going to pay you, something like that, right? They're not going to pay sure, you thousands I'm of sure. dollars a day. Yeah, I mean, ethically, they can't they can't pay so much that it would be construed as a, uh, I, you know, as a, as an bribe. inducement right. that would that would sway you to take unnecessary risks. So they they do have to be a little careful about that. But if you were, I don't know, if if you're in a a situation where you don't have a lot of responsibilities that you'd have to take care of at home, and you could really use a couple of weeks off and just hanging out and browsing the internet and whatever. Um, I don't know. Not too bad a deal. We should point Help out, this is, this is not a challenge experiment, okay? These people are vaccinated. Right. They're getting a vaccine experiment. virus. They're not getting a virus expected to cause disease, right? Right. Um, anyway, so they give yeah. these people orally the virus. That's how you take it. And then they observe them for two weeks for side effects. They take blood and look for an immune response. They look for um, fecal shedding and then they uh, sequence the virus. They put it into mice to see if it's neurovirulent and so forth. Um, and some of them kept shedding after they left. <laughs> That's typical for uh, polio viruses. They can shed for many, many weeks uh, in the feces after infection. But they said, we kept them in Belgium until they stopped shedding. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you give them chocolate, Dixon, right? Yeah. Right. 
Well, yeah, luckily, absolutely. none of them were immune compromised. Well, I right, think that they, was one of the screening. Yeah, the screening because like things. Adam has a paper that talks about an immune compromised yeah. patient shedding for like 28 for years. years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, so they had, all right, so they had some side effects, um, but none of them, you know, n nobody died. Let's put it that way. No one was disabled. Um, what kind of side effects they had? No serious advents event, adverse events. I think the one thing, they had an increased aspartate aminotransferase in a few of these patients. I don't know what that means. Well, that's a sign liver that there's something inside. going on in your liver. Yeah, that's right. But uh, these were in the absence of any symptoms. Yeah. Right. And then they could find RNA in the stool after a few days of administration and every participant in one group and 87% of the others. And as I said, the, some of them kept shedding. <laughs> the last days of shedding for any volunteers were day 89 for candidate one and day 48 for candidate two. Shedding occurred more rapidly, cessation occurred more rapidly for, after the use of candidate two than one. Two is the codon deoptimized hmm. candidate. Um, and then um, they looked at immunogenicity as well, which they found was comparable to, you know, what you would see for Sabin two. Now, so uh, these people, uh, have all previously been immunized. That's right. So immunogenicity is basically a boost. looking at a boost. That's right. In antibody titers over what they had previously. Right. That's okay. right. Yeah. I, I I don't, you know, there's a phase two ongoing. I don't know if they are doing that in naive people, you know, probably not because those would be young kids who would never receive polio vaccine, I would right. guess. So it would have to be adults. Uh, they took all these viruses, um, and put them in mouse neurovirulence assay, no neurovirulence, no paralysis, any mouse um, with candidate one. They did find four mice paralyzed out of 30 with candidate two vaccine bulk material, <laughs> which, so candidate two, we didn't talk about. That's the codon deoptimized virus. But as they said in the other paper, none of the, Viruses excreted by these people had changes in that critical base at 480. They had changes elsewhere. Uh, and in that paper, they had put them into transgenic mice and none of them uh, were paralytogenic. Compared with, you know, Sabin 2, you would get paralysis uh, a few days after inoculation. All the modifications, so the 15 samples given with candidate 1, that's the candidate we talked about previously, all the modifications were retained no variance in domain in the domain in the five prime end. Um, they got changes elsewhere, but did not increase the neurovirulence of these viruses. And by the way, this is the first study to generate human clinical data for a polio vaccine in almost sixty years. And yes, <laughs> isn't that amazing? Those vaccines have done really well, right? Yeah, yeah. We didn't need to do any other trials. They say uh, they're, they were going to begin a phase two in October 2018. That's ongoing, I think, without containment measures, but with an extensive plan for monitoring stool samples. That's for safety, immunogenicity, genetic stability, and neurovirulence. And then they say, if necessary, we'll do a phase three, but it's not clear that they're going to do that. Yeah, I think, um, so phase one, primarily you're looking for for toxicity, you're looking for any mm -hmm. kind of a safety signal. And this came out very safe for the volunteers and looks like it's safe for the community too, which is why they're going to a um, to an uncontained yeah. phase two. They don't have to lock everybody up and they presumably got their parking spaces back. Um, <laughs> so now so now in the phase two, they're looking in, in a larger group and going to look for immunogenicity and all these other factors. And then... I don't know. I think the phase three is just next time you've got a phase two out, uh, a type two outbreak. Yes. Um, I bet. Go in, in one area, you know, go in and vaccinate with this vaccine. Um, cause just I think by that. that, by then, assuming the phase two goes well, they will have demonstrated yeah. that this is no worse than giving the, yeah. the Sabin. Yeah. I think that's the plan. Now they say, you know, this is, genetically stable it's more stable than opv yep but it's a small number of people right 
And what happens when, as Alan says, you put this in to mop up a type two outbreak and now it's in thousands and thousands of people circulating extensively. I would bet on the virus. <laughs> <laughs> Always bet on the virus. I think the virus will come up with something, right? I think so. Yeah, I think I, so. I, I'm torn on that because I would really like to see this approach succeed. And, oh, I, I, agree. and I think they've done some, some really clever stuff. And I say, I think um, Vimmer's code on optimized approach is also very clever. And I'd like to see that work. But um, but yeah, I'm hesitant to bet against the virus. But what was the code? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. But don't you feel, Alan, after reading the um, RSV paper where code on deoptimization didn't really work? Polio is more promiscuous than RSV right. by far. I mean, we're like not even on the same playing fields. So I'm kind I, of I'm more not, skeptical of that yeah, one than I am. I'm this one, not yes. thinking that the optimization is the way I'm gonna go. Right. But this this one with the rearrangement moving Cree and, and the the Stem it has a better that. chance for sure. It, it does seem to have a better chance, and it looked it does look a little bit better in the phase one, um, but uh, but even so. So according right. to uh, clinicaltrials.gov, yeah. phase two is completed. Oh, phase two study to evaluate safety and immunogenicity of two oral polio vaccine candidates. So they've tried both. They put both of them in phase two. Yeah, maybe in two more years we'll find out what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, where? Do these outbreaks show up? So if you go to polioeradication.org, most of them are in Africa, Central Africa, by far. And then- Not Pakistan? There are a few in Pakistan and Afghanistan. There have been some scattered throughout Asia, but mainly in- um, There's one in Israel. Is it type two in Israel? Well, there was definitely a polio vaccine out, uh, 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 outbreak of polio derived- but what's interesting, Alan, is that we've talked to like Mark Palanche at the CDC about certain things. And it's clear that certain countries don't really survey for polio. Yes. So oh, yeah. Don't oh, yeah. really know That's where well it known. is. Yeah. yeah. Well, the yeah. reason I the reason I asked about where it's going to break out is I'm sitting here thinking that if you're going to uh, go on to what we're calling a phase three trial, OK, which is basically using this. Uh, in the situation of an outbreak, you're going to want to, uh, you know, monitor the consequences very closely. Yes. And then I'm so I'm thinking, well, what sort of an environment is this going to be done with in and how difficult is that monitoring going to be? And what I'm hearing is it's probably going to be pretty difficult. Yes. Given the environments where this shows up. Well, I think on polio eradication that or not only do they have the number of outbreaks, I think they have the number of death of workers, you know, you, and they do, it does periodically make the news about how a polio so, so. worker went into Afghanistan and was killed yeah, yeah. Yeah. or went into yeah. Pakistan and is killed. But, but it's also, it's, it's amazing how thorough these workers usually are. Uh, my wife and I were in India on a vacation and they did a, obviously a, a polio survey and you could see on every house, every door was the date that they were there and how many people lived inside. Hmm. Well, how many people they think lived inside? Well, <laughs> right. No, there's you, you, lots of- You only of, have their word to go by. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, there's lots of reports about, especially like uh, on the Pakistan Indian border and stuff um, where they, gone to or North India where they've gone and people hide and then they don't answer the door. They tell you the wrong number of kids or something or whether. So well, recently we, can be. Yeah, which is, recently, which is by the way, not an irrational thing to do in those places where people knocking on the door saying they're from the correct. government are not necessarily bringing you good tidings. That's right. Well, it may not no, be the government. <laughs> right. But the government also is not always your friend. Yes. Especially in these. Places. That was my point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a, this was uh, one of the things that um, I think that I had a discussion most recently with Nishay about um, and his work on AFM in the northern part of India. Where, you know, what, where's that section that he and Ian go to? Vincent. Section of India? Yeah, where they have the kids that have AFM oh. and it's. Uttar Pradesh. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's like piss poor, beyond piss poor. Uh, one more comment I have about this new poly. By the way, so this, folks, this is a great example of, as Alan said, basic science being used to redesign the vaccine. People have been talking about this for years. I don't know. Even if it works, Alan, isn't it? I mean, the other OPV is still circulating, and this may not be able to displace it. Right. Right? Because, you know, as you know, viral variants arise and displace each other all the time. Yes, yes and they do, <laughs> as we're all getting reminded lately. So the idea would be that you go in with NOPV2, and now that's going to displace the other OPV. But I think NOPV2 is less fit than OPV2. So yes. it might not work. But we'll see. We'll, we're going to have to do the experiment, right? Yeah. Do the um, uh, vaccine-derived, I'm trying to think of the acronym. I can't keep polio. it on the yeah. VDPV, vaccine-derived yeah. polio. Yeah. yeah. Do they require a human reservoir or yes. can they be yes. maintained? Is there an animal reservoir? No. No, 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 no. Okay. All human, that's yeah. The, that's, a, that's a bedrock uh, concept of the eradication campaign. There's no animal host for any of these viruses. And so what happens no is as you, when you get OPV, you know, it reproduces in your gut, you shed it. And then as it spreads through the population, very quickly it retain it, it reacquires the changes it needs to be more fit. And that's why it propagates because if it were right. a vaccine virus, it would never probably propagate. It propagates because it, it mutates. And so I just wonder if the NOPV to compete with it. They should actually do some competition experiments in cell cultures and well, in animals. Well, does, right? does, really does it really have to compete? I mean, if you, if you wind up with essentially everybody immunized and if there's no animal reservoir for the vaccine-derived polio, maybe over time it just disappears. Over, over time, it will eventually. The issue is that as it circulates, especially if it gets into somebody who's immunocompromised who can then go on to shed it for the next 30 years, um, that's just going to keep going uh, and you may never be able to stop it until that person is gone. Um, so, I, I mean, Vincent's point is very good that you could deploy this and maybe cut down on the circulating vaccine derived virus, but maybe, maybe it's just not going to go away. I mean, the problem is that you always have pockets of people who don't get immunized, right? Yes. Because governments get tired of, doing immunization and well they, because the whole campaign has been packaged as a one and done thing like oh you only have to immunize till we eradicate yeah, the virus then true. you can stop immunizing and they say eh, you know cases are way down let's stop immunizing um yeah, that's true well the other thing is is as vincent came and said to me yesterday about herd immunity right so what's the definition of herd immunity and what is immunity in during polio? And I believe that it's addressed at the very beginning of the paper, right? Where they talk about, you know, circulating virus immunizes a population, but that it's not really, they're not really immunized. What? You can't. Do you remember what I'm talking about, Vincent? Yeah. So the the, the two vaccines. Yeah, so. This is a good point. Thanks for bringing it up. I wanted to actually discuss it. So, inactivated polio vaccine prevents polio in the recipient. No problem with that, right? But it does not prevent your intestine from being infected, and right. it does not prevent you from shedding virus. Should wild virus be circulating, so. There can be no herd immunity with IPV. Right. Unless herd immunity is defined as no disease. So if it's defined as no transmission. Well, reduction in disease maybe because right. they're if right. they're, I mean, I, I don't know. If you had 80% of the population immune with IPV, maybe the likelihood that, you know, a transmitter is going to encounter a non-immune person is so low and that confers some protection. But it does not. But if everybody can be a transmitter, then that transmitter yeah, encounters right. immune right. people who act as transmitters. Yeah. I mean, I don't think the concept of herd immunity 
has a useful meaning if you're if you're only referring no. to stopping pathogenesis. I think you're right. So I, for I IPV, the, there is none. Yes. The idea is is that could you reach some threshold where you actually stop transmission, and that is yeah. another bedrock assumption of the eradication campaign. That's is right. Is that it's possible to achieve that? Because if you can't, then you can't eradicate the virus. Right now with with. OPV. Which is another reason why eradication is setting such a high bar that I don't think we should be so focused on trying to clear. Well, I don't think we're going to reach it. No, because and and I think <laughs> a, a better approach to this whole thing is to say, we're not going to eradicate surveying. the virus. Let's, <laughs> let's control the virus. Let's continue vaccinating. No, you're not ever going to be able to stop vaccinating in, in a reasonable time frame. But you shouldn't be thinking of that. You should be thinking of building a sustainable public health infrastructure because once you have that, then you can vaccinate against all these other vaccine preventable diseases that are still killing and maiming your people. Yes, or I could just stop surveying. Or you, yeah, so you could just say we, ha we see no <laughs> polio in the population. We're just not going to look. Right? Now, yeah. on, on the other it's hand- worked for us for a while. Yeah. Okay, on the <laughs> other hand, OPV immunizes your gut. Yes. And can prevent shedding. So it could get you to hurt it. Could get you. But there's another factor which really doesn't apply for most other vaccines that we've talked about. And that is OPV, you shed it and it transmits to other people. Yes. And it was shown by Sabin in communities where you give OPV, the people who don't get it, they get it. Secondary vaccination. Yes. Secondary vaccination, which is not... What, what we use to mean herd immunity, right? That's no. not the, no. no. But this is Im immunizing you in a different way. And so you achieve herd immunity by both, the combination of reducing transmission and actually getting but the vaccine. But the downside is that in the process of doing that, you're throwing off these vaccine-derived yes. paralytic variants constantly. And so it's just, it's a chicken and egg believe. problem. But Sabin didn't believe his virus was ever reverting. Oh, right. yes, that's true. He did not believe <laughs> he did it. did not believe that I this have, was ever. I have a letter he from. He probably wrote many nasty, nasty letters saying, you don't understand. He wrote right. me letters where he said, so there was a famous isolate from a kid who got paralyzed after vaccination of type three. Okay. Type three, one, one, nine was the isolate number. And this was, the genome sequence was done uh, by Jeff Almond in the 80s, and it showed this was clearly a vaccine revertant, right? Albert Sabin never believed it. He didn't get the molecular biology, I guess, but he kept saying, oh, that was isolated in Romania where wild viruses for, were circulating. It's clearly a wild virus. It's not my vaccine. He went to his grave not believing that his vaccine could cause polio. Which I guess is good for him. He, he went. He died content, right? <laughs> well, right. I mean, he he should have died content in any case because his vaccine is brilliant and has has saved millions of people from from debilitating injury or death. And and yeah, who asked uh, he me made my a huge favorite? Contribution, but he had a blind spot about yeah, his vaccines. Problem. Many people do. do. Who asked me my favorite vaccine? It was Wednesday night. Wednesday night. The live stream. Uh, someone said, what's your favorite vaccine? And uh, Amy said, I can tell you what Vincent's favorite vaccine is. You didn't answer what yours was, did you? Yeah, I did. What was your favorite vaccine? So I, I, I do like OPV. You do like OPV. Dixon, what's I, your I favorite like vaccine? Yellow fever. Ah, mm. yeah, I can see why. How about you, Rich? I know it. Uh, that's a tough one. My <laughs> knee-jerk reaction, of course, was smallpox. But but you know what? I think it may be the mRNA COVID yeah. vaccines. Yeah, those are pretty they're cool. Because they're just awesome. I, I, I will reverse myself on that. <laughs> I yeah, I, I might. I, I think I would go for the, the mRNA COVID vaccines just for, for yeah. gee whiz factor. That's it right. is cool. Right. That was my second uh, choice. Uh, yeah, beyond, beyond gee whiz, I mean, look at what they're doing. Yeah, exactly. it's incredible. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, so uh, I just want to uh, one last comment. We were talking about I don't know if it's the last comment, but we were talking about uh, the vaccine spreading. Um, and uh, the one thing I think piece of data missing with uh, this uh, new construct is that we don't know how transmissible it is. So we don't right. know mm -hmm. how it would behave in that circumstance. However, that's true. And it doesn't seem to be compromised in any sort of 
uh, replication in culture or anything like right. that. So there's no evidence that it wouldn't be just as transmissible as, uh, you know, the standard OPV. In direct competition, I suspect it will suffer a fitness disadvantage. Probably, yeah. Just we, because we the, messed with the it, right? attenuating <laughs> mutations do decrease mm -hmm. total virus reproduction. And that's what gets you to neurovirulence. And that's why there's a selective pressure to mutate back to, um, to neurovirulence. So we have 30... Well, I don't think it re reverts back to neurovirulence because well, it needs to be neurovirulence. No, no, that's what I'm saying. Neurovirulence is it's, just a secondary or tertiary That's why it reverts, it reverts back to neurovirulence because neurovirulence is a correlate of oh, okay. better replication. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's yeah, a, that's the it. selective pressure. Got it. I was, uh, yeah. No, so, the virus doesn't care if it's... Yeah. Doesn't no, care if it's, it's a dead end. It's a dead end. Yeah. Um, so we have 36% of the U.S. fully vaccinated. 47% one dose. more than that. I heard 47%. Uh, that's yeah, one dose. One, one, one immunization. One and dose. these numbers get uh, these numbers get weird because you hear like 75%, but that's adults. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think it, right. you, you really have to know the denominator. Yeah. In all of these now cases, and whether 12, you're talking about one or two doses. And it also, it also varies a lot locally from state to state and even yeah, from, yeah, yeah, yeah. from town to town. And what do you think about Missouri offering a million dollars? No, Ohio. Sorry, it's Ohio. They're having a lottery to get people to take the vaccine. <laughs> and one of those people that, that hasn't got it yet but will take it will end up with a million dollar check. I think it's brilliant. I do too. <laughs> someone, I absolutely think so too. Someone <laughs> asked us the other night, could I go five times to increase my chances of winning? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Why not? Well, isn't New Jersey giving away a beer or movie tickets or something? Something like that. There are a bunch of giveaways with this. Wasn't Krispy Kreme going to give away donuts for a year or something? Good Lord. Could be. I mean, a the year? truth is, is we give That's away crap. <laughs> well, we give away crap. We give away stuff for other, for like. For stupid reasons. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Thank you. I want a toaster. Right. You know? <laughs> I want a great $35. Buddy. Get out oh, your no. Bed Bath & Beyond coupon and order. Like. I want a, ga a gravy boat. That's what they used to give away in the movies. <laughs> How about a fly swatter? Let's read, yeah. uh, let's read a couple of emails, okay? Sure. Alan, okay. Alan, can you take that first one? Sure. Matilda writes, Dear Vincent and colleagues, I often listen to TWIV and always appreciate the discussions. I was very happy to see that one of our papers was discussed in TWIV 753. I'm the first author on the study on flu transmission from the nose of ferrets. I just wanted to add a few comments about certain points of your discussion. One comment about why we used silent substitutions to tag the viruses. We indeed took this approach, as Alan Bri and Brianne mentioned, because of the constraints of the flu genome for reporter integration and the need to have viruses with the identical biological properties. A few studies have described influenza viruses carrying reported genes, but these are still attenuated or depending on, um, dependent on the size of the reporter, genetically unstable. Other viruses that have fewer constraints on the size of their genome, uh, i.e. CDV, CDV. Canine distemper. Canine, Canine distemper virus. virus. Thank you. Um, can better accommodate reporter genes. One comment about the last part of your discussion on measles. Colleagues of ours actually performed a study on canine distemper virus in ferrets as a model for measles. Gives the link. They inoculated donor ferrets with three viruses harboring three different fluorescent reporters via different inoculation routes, intraocular, intranasal, and intratracheal, and placed recipient ferrets two days after inoculation in the same transmission setup. In contrast with flu, transmission of can um, canine distemper virus occurs in the late phase of the infection, and the three viruses that were inoculated in different sites were not compartmentalized any anymore at the time of transmission. As a result, the dominant virus was the one that transmitted independent of the site of inoculation. In contrast, we observed a strong compartmentalization of influenza viruses upon co-inoculation in the nose and in the trachea when we performed similar studies to study reassortment. It gives another link. Regarding the discussion of aerosols originating from the LRT. Lower respiratory lower tract. Respira oh, right, lower respiratory tract <laughs> and droplets in the F. upper respiratory <laughs> tract. I think this, when I... I would get these acronyms if I was sitting here reading, but when I'm reading out loud, somehow they just, um, uh, I think this needs to be taken with a grain of salt and should be carefully extrapolated to the transmission of other viruses like measles, for instance. 
We also discussed in the paper other aspects like the possibility for droplets to become smaller to a certain extent via desiccation and the stability and variability, uh, stability and viability of viruses in droplets of different sizes. Hmm. Finally, to answer the comment of Brianne about the impact of the inoculation route on the pathogenesis of the virus, this has been done in many occasions with human and avian influenza viruses. Here's just one example with H5N1, where intranasal inoculation resulted in dissemination of the virus to the brain, whereas intratracheal inoculation resulted in severe bronchointerstitial pneumonia. And gives the link. Thanks again for discussing our work. This was an honor. And Matilda's an assistant professor, uh, Department of Virus Science at Erasmus. Thank you. Nice. That's... Uh our second letter today from Erasmus. From, from Erasmus, <laughs> yes. So that's interesting that measles transmission is late. And that makes sense because the virus gets in the respiratory tract, right. establishes a viremia, and then days later comes back to the bottom of the respiratory epithelium, enters, reproduces in, and then spreads. It has to go all the way around. Because yeah. it doesn't initially enter the epithelium. It enters in immune cells in the lung, and then they go inside. So that's very right. cool. Very cool. Thank you, Matilda. Dixon, would you like to read this I'll poem? I'll read it. I will read the poem, but it's actually a song by Paul Simon. <laughs> and it's a great song, but uh, the cadence of this uh, is a little bit off. So I will give you the title first. 15 ways to stay free of COVID should be actually 15 ways to stay COVID free. <laughs> and if you said COVID free, it, then the cadence is okay. So the problem is all inside your head, she said to me. The answer is easy if you take it logically. I'd like to help you in your struggle to be free. There must be 15 ways to stay COVID free. <laughs> She said, it's really not my habit to intrude, and furthermore, I hope my meaning won't be lost or misconstrued, but I'll repeat myself at the risk of being rude. There must be 15 ways to say COVID-free. Yes, 15 ways to say COVID-free. Just one little prick, Mick, to make your immune, June. It ain't going to hurt, Bert, and then you'll be free. Don't make such a fuss, Gus. There's no need to cuss, Russ. So easy to see, B. How to keep yourself free. Just two shots to take, Jake. Get it while you can, Ann. Don't want to beg, Craig. Just listen to me. You won't feel any pain, Jane. It's part of the plan, Jan. So easy to see, Lee. Two shots and you're free. She said, it grieves me so to see the virus cause so much pain. I wish there was something I could do to make folks smile again. I said, I appreciate that. And then, would you please explain about the 15 ways? She said, well, why don't we both just sleep on it tonight? Just understand the virus and you'll be begin to see the light. Then she jabbed me with her needle and I knew that she was right about the 15 ways to say COVID free. Yes, 15 ways to say COVID free. Uh, just open that vial, Lyle, and get the vaccine, Gene. Just pull up your sleeve, Steve, to stay COVID free. There's no need to snarl, Carl, to whine or to moan, Joan. Don't be a jerk, Dirk. It's as easy as can be, D, to stay COVID free. Two shots in your set, Chet. It's part of the plan, Stan. This vaccine's not a scam, Sam. Just listen to me. A tiny little stick, Dick. We'll do it right quick, Nick. For you and for me, Bree, let's stay COVID free. Nice job, Dixon. Excellent. There, that's excellent. Yeah, good job, Dixon. Well, thank you. So we got to get our uh, friends to. Um, I could have sung it, but you would have yes. been uh, horrified. Please, someone <laughs> sing it, record it for us. We'd love. We'll put it on our channel for you. Yeah, oh, but, uh, I would love. Who was the the couple that did? Um, he yeah, was on uh, piano uh, and she was singing. Yeah, yeah. in San, uh, Santa Fe, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Joe Illig and Gina They're Browning. Opera singers. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's up on the YouTube channel. So if anyone wants to put this to music, we'd love to have it. Oh, it's got music. You just have to put the words in. I wonder yes. if Paul <laughs> Simons lets us to Twiv. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't no? I doubt it. I doubt it. I doubt it. I think we asked that before. Remember we did an episode <laughs> where <laughs> their album, Simon and Garfunkel's The Sounds of some, of Silencing, uh, yeah. remember? Yes. Yeah, oh, Sounds of Silencing. Silence. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. And I seem to remember somewhere someone saying that, yeah, he listens to Twiv. Is that and possible? And you, you had a pick. You had a pick that was a cover of "Sound of Silence." Yeah, once. the album. Yeah. yeah, very cool. 
Yeah. Um, Amy, can you take the next one? Sure. Carl writes, dear Vincent and friends, you were talking about NLA Lennox recently, so I thought you might like to see this. Thank you all for educating us, the public at large. Keep up the excellent work. Best wishes, Caroline. Just to communicate. Dear friends, a few weeks ago, I guess this is a letter by Annie. I was fortunate enough to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19. I believe that everyone in the world should have the right to be protected from this potentially deadly virus. This is why I'm joining forces with the People's Vaccine Campaign, asking President Biden to join developing nations and calling on pharmaceutical companies to suspend the patents on COVID-19 vaccines so that this life protecting vaccine can be available to everyone around the world. We need to boost production in all parts of the world as soon as possible. Please join me, take a moment to send an urgent message to President Biden using the buttons below and ask your friends if they can do to Annie Lennox. So while um, they eventually did waive the patent rights. Uh, did they? Or yeah, this I, is just being I, discussed? I well, thought the president that. President discussed it. Yeah. This is. Oh, I thought he. Well, floated they, as a, they floated. I misspoke. Yeah. Maybe the, I misunderstood. The president sure. encouraged it. Yes. Encouraged it. It doesn't uh, really solve the problem because the problem isn't really the patent, right? It's no, the it's manufacturing. A it's a projection. It's, right. Yeah. It's the, so unless you're going to also build plants. The patent is not the only problem, but it is a potential hurdle. Right, but the larger potential hurdle. The is larger not issue. A potential hurdle anymore is yes. there is no infrastructure globally. So we had lunch with someone who wants to make a global international FDA. Remember that, Vincent? No, I don't remember. <laughs> we had lunch with Ian, and that's what his goal is now. Is oh, like okay. he talked about. <laughs> I remember that. Okay, I didn't know he wanted to make an international FDA. Uh, Maybe yeah. I kind of zoned out during that part. Maybe, <laughs> Maybe you were engulfing a sandwich. I don't know. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you still need the infrastructure. Yes. Yep. And you've I, had, I will. I will say my already substantial crush on Annie Lennox is now boundless. This is this is great that she's, she's fabulous. Using this on and using her facts. fame for good, for such uh, purpose. Very good. She's wonderful. I used to listen to her all the time while I yeah. painted at the Art Students League. Was, yes, uh, relaxing. She's great, and, but still, yeah. you've had fourteen months to build some kind of infrastructure. It doesn't have to, you know, be fancy. It just doesn't have to blow away in the wind either. <laughs> um, but. We seem not to, you know, internationally not to have done that. Well, there are, yeah, there are a bunch of issues here. And it, there is there is vaccine production and mRNA, even mRNA vaccine production potentially um, elsewhere in the world. And it is possible that there are companies that were holding off on this because of the patents. If that is the case, then this would be a barrier to clear. And this is this is a paper barrier that's, a whole lot easier to remove than the infrastructure barriers that you're pointing to quite legitimately. Um, but this is, this is something that could be lowered with a stroke of a pen potentially. True. Yeah. Whereas you can't just say, let there be a vaccine manufacturing facility. No. Really? I don't no, know. Maybe. <laughs> maybe you can, but it won't happen. <laughs> well, well, China, I bet China could do it. I bet. I was going to say. Yes. But right. they don't need so, it. They're okay. Right. They've, they've got their situation covered, yeah. but Yeah. But what's, in, I was going to say, because it's amazing that they, for both outbreaks, SARS and this outbreak, they built a hospital in 10 days. Yeah. Uh, India, I think, would have the capacity to do this. Yeah, yeah well, India no, is not right. having the capacity to do anything. They are having, sick. yes, they're having a separate problem. Yeah, they're having a bigger <laughs> problem. They're so, sick um, and not feeling well. One should be hope quarantined. It's hard to drain the swamp when you're up to your butt in alligators. Yes. So, Amy, as a fan of Canada, why can't they, they got? They don't have any vaccine manufacturing. Why not? They decided it was not economically feasible. Really? And I they bet still, they're going to revisit that decision. No, they that has nothing no. to do with anything. By the way, <laughs> what no, do you mean? They, because the health of their citizens come first. It yes, doesn't of matter course. How much it costs? Of course. Period. Well, having lived in Canada. That's the that's what you would like to think, but there is still um, a two tiered system where you, if you have wealth, you are you can pay outside of the system and get what you want. 
the vaccine, they still don't feel that they need to invest in manufacturing. They are still going to, they, ha, they will not go back and develop a manufacturing plant. Their policy will not change. It will still be, we can, we can generate, we can buy enough vaccine from the United States or someplace. Else. How's that worked out during the pandemic? Well, so for my friends, and I've been corrected on numerous times from various other people. So as I said, for my friends, it's not worked out so successful. So Where one of them- Are they? They are in Quebec. So one of them lives outside Montreal, who's pregnant. And her significant other, up at, at least up until the last time I spoke to her, which was a week ago, had not been vaccinated. And she was only prioritized recently to be vaccinated because she's pregnant. My other friends who live in Montreal, his two children have not been vaccinated, but he has and his parents have because they're like in their 80s. And my friend is late 50s. Um, and then... Two other friends that I spoke to yesterday, one has been vaccinated and one has not because they ran out of vaccine or something like that. The provinces don't allow intraprovincial travel, do they? No. So That's remarkable. That is absolutely remarkable. Well, the other problem is, is that while, you know, you read and I know from people and, and who travel between Texas and California and various other southern states, that they are rapidly crossing the border, like Mexicans and others are buying what is called a, a vaccine vacation. So they go onto the Walgreens website or wherever they schedule their vaccine, and then they buy their airplane ticket, and you can go you can go back and forth between Mexico like that. So while you can fly into the United States from Canada, the problem is is that you cannot get back into Canada. Right. So you have to go to a federal or a governmental hotel for three days. And then you have to go quarantine at home for another 10 days. And while Americans would that's just That's a vacation. Say, <laughs> <laughs> you just blew your vacation. <laughs> well, yes, that's true. But while Americans say, oh, quarantining is on your honor system, the police actually come in or whatever they're referred to as, but- We'll think of them simply as the police come and knock on your door to make sure you are quarantining or your neighbors sometimes turn you in. The Royal Mounted Police. I want to go on record <laughs> to say that Canada's idea is a bad idea not to have manufacturing of, farm, of a vaccine. I would agree okay? with you. I, would I think agree. it's crazy. We're, telling, we're talking about helping other countries to build capacity. Yep. I mean, this is ridiculous. They have a lot of people in Canada, too. I think we need so a global that, manufacturing capacity that would save, serve better. everyone, right? Like WHO should be in charge of this. And I'll put Rich in charge of it. Good. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. He's got nothing else over. to do now, right? He's retired. Yeah. yeah. All right, Rich. <laughs> no problem. Rich, can you take the next one, please? Chelsea writes, good morning. It's currently a sunny 64 degrees Fahrenheit with an anticipated high of 90 here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Hello, first summer of the season. First summer. First of the summer season. of the season. That's yeah. Nebraska weather. Okay. okay. Um, my brother-in-law turned me on to Twib a few months ago, and I have added you to my podcast shuffle. Working in the lab, I listen to a lot of podcasts. This morning, I caught Twib seven forty-five as I got my degree with the pipe dream of working a zoo and uh, working in a zoo and interning my college summers at the Henry Doolery Zoo and Aquarium in Omaha. It was a fascinating lesson. And imagine my surprise as I sit in front of my bench and hear guest Nadine Lamberski identify my employer, Zoetis, while explaining some of the gorilla treatments. It was a trip. Just a small note, though, it is pronounced Zoetis rather than Zoetis. <laughs> no worries. My husband always pronounced it Zoetis, too. And when I interviewed with the company, I had to trick the interviewer into pronouncing it for me so I would know. <laughs> Have a great day, Chelsea. Great. That's cool. Be sitting there yeah, pipetting cool. cool. at Zoetis and have you mentioned? <laughs> cool. All right, one more from Richard. Please know my cattle enjoy TWIV. <laughs> For your voices from my pocket, 
signal fresh grass and hay. My department chair employed, implored me to listen to TWIV, and my graduate advisor stressed saying yes to academic superiors whenever possible. So my herd and I listened to TWIV together. I'm perplexed that cattle farmers who vaccinate regularly to build and maintain their own herd immunity for protection against various wee beasties. Neighbors who know firsthand that unvaccinated cattle suffer and die, yet display reluctance toward vaccine efficacy and safety during the current human pandemic. Do you have a sister podcast this week in psychology? <laughs> <laughs> Can you recommend any links on engaging with vaccine reluctance? I secure my cattle in a head gate before jabbing each of them. Such is not ethical in humans. <laughs> Richard is uh, adjunct faculty at King University in Bristol, Tennessee, eating heifer burger for lunch as I type, as she did not fit the herd phenotype we select for. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anybody know uh, links on engaging well, with vaccines? ASV, ASV.org slash education. That's a good You one. can actually uh, register for a town hall and ask your questions right there. Real time. Yep. That's one. Any others? Uh, the, uh, what is it? Uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia vaccine education site. That's right. That's a very good okay, one. Okay, really good. There's also immunize.org, which is the Immunization Action Coalition. They're more of a policy-oriented thing, but they have a lot of useful links. Yep. Um, and um, uh, Families Fighting Flu is a good one for mm -hmm. flu vaccine and, and also general vaccine information. All right. There you go, Richard. I always like to call them out. Yeah, we've learned all about cattle and heifers and cows <laughs> and steers. Oh, boy. <laughs> I forget what the genus name was. Anybody remember? Orock. 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 Very good. Orock. Let's do some picks. Dixon, what you got? Well, uh, I've got something that might appeal to Rich and several others of us, uh, maybe everybody. It's called Five Deeps. And it's a summary of a research program uh, instituted by Newfeld University in England, I believe. And their goal was to take a manned submersible to the deepest part of every f of the five oceans. So they went to the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Arctic, the Southern, and the Indian Ocean. And they, they submersed to the deepest part of each of those five oceans. And then they uh, are studying all kinds of things. And I'm trying to access the Word document that's explaining something that I never knew anything about. It's got a special term for the deepest part of any ocean. And it's called the Haddle Zone, hmm. also known as the Haddo-Pelagic Zone, is the deepest region, region of the ocean lying within oceanic trenches. The Haddle Zone. We can fix what it happened to the other two oceans? Isn't there seven oceans of the world? Well, they say seven oceans, the Mediterranean Ocean is, or sea is considered an ocean. No, here I'm back again. <laughs> so the Haddle Zone is found from a depth of around 6,000 to 11,000 meters or 20,000 to 36,000 feet and exists in long but narrow topographic V-shaped depressions. Now, here's the research goals of this group. Find deep sea fissure, uh, features and inhabitants using a high-resolution multi-beam sonar. Learn what lives in those habitats using direct visualization by landers, which is a... Um, a, a, a kind of a, a um, it's a way of looking through the uh, the submersible. Uh, discover how organisms survive in haddle zones using the pressure drops outboard wet lab, and I recommend definitely going to their website because there's a lot of terminology I was unfamiliar with. Determining organisms' roles in each given ecosystem. Connect the five deeps through genetic differentiation of species found on the dives and determine which rules the organisms follow, including features, behaviors, and characteristics of a species that are shared globally. Wow. And, you know, we know more about Mars and Jupiter than we do about our own ocean. Mm. So I think that's why this has so uh, been as a neglected area. But And no one cares what's happening at the very bottom of every ocean. They don't think it can affect anything. But actually, that's not true because it can 
subtend under a tectonic plate, and what's ever contaminating this trench can end up in a volcano spewing out all over the earth again. So I think we should care about everything. And this group did a great job of doing that, and I, uh, I salute them. Imagine what it feels like to go down in one of these little submersibles to the very, 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 very bottom of the Mariana Trench. Mm-hmm. I don't think I can handle the pressure. I, I, you know what? <laughs> That's very well put. <laughs> well, this is an amazing enterprise. This the, is very the, cool. the boat they put together is, yes, yes. you know, uh, highly uh, specialized for this. I guess the expedition takes, has this happened or is it It's happened? done. It's absolutely finished. They've took done a it. year. Okay. What, yep. what an adventure. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Amazing. Exactly. Wow. And the well, what did they really find? Nice. I would love to know what they found. Who well, paid we'll for this? Who paid for this? That's a good question, actually. I do they not pay. know. They mentioned it, some kind of Discovery Channel thing, and I'm not sure what else. They were supposed to have <laughs> a presentation of their findings, but they I, don't, I haven't seen any uh, cool. notification of that. So why don't they do the Mediterranean? Too small? Not Correct. Right. It's not very deep. Oh, yeah. Okay. Not by this standard. Not I mean, it's deep, standard. but it's not like... It doesn't even... It's not deeper than 6,000 feet, that's right. for sure. Oh, they so could, they won't they, even consider it. They could knock that yeah. off in an afternoon. They could do a scuba dive through that. <laughs> really? 6,000 feet? You could scuba? No, no, no. No, no, no. no, no, no. no of course not. Of course not. Oh, no, I don't it. think... The, I don't, what is the absolute deepest part of the Mediterranean? Anybody want to Google that one? No, no. I don't know. No I don't idea. I think it's more than 1,000 feet. I don't think it's more than 1,000 But, you know, feet. Dixon, you said something that I really like. What was that? You said you should. we should care about everything. Yeah, we should, actually. I like that very much. I don't think you you, you haven't got a way of knowing whether that exactly. will be important or not. Exactly. Right. You never know. And people who Sorry. say you know, Amy, does I this know. sound familiar? You're going to know what the results are, so we shouldn't fund this work? <laughs> Yes, it does. Why well, write a grant? Because you have to predict the results anyway. Oh my right? God. <laughs> I hate when people well, write on a grant application that we will not learn anything from this proposal. How oh, the hell right. do you know? Exactly. I get right. that exactly all the time right. from one specific <laughs> review. No, I do. I get that all the time from one specific reviewer. We This is going to illuminate nothing. Good Lord. And, and then like I wait like, Various amounts of time. Sometimes it's very rapid that you can notice that the guy's an idiot um, because a paper will, you know, come out within a month of me getting this piece of paper that proves that what I said was right and he, he, he was wrong. Or sometimes I have to wait a couple of years and then we discover that, oh, wait, uh, she actually was right again. So like the the paper that you guys discuss on on Tuesday, the TLR2 and um, SARS-CoV-2 and envelope pro- protein, right? Um, so I wrote a grant and said, oh, you know, the sensor, yes, I agree. The, we think that the sensor is X for the virus that I'm interested in. But, you know, there's other things that are in the, virus particle besides the RNA that could be triggering. And, you know, we know that VLPs from Entro 71 uh, tickle TLR4, blah, blah, blah. And the guy wrote back, we know everything. It all goes through MDA5. And <laughs> and then he comes from a flu lab, he comes from a very prestigious flu lab slash flu department. And then lo and so you can make that argument for rig eye and flu, right? And then lo and behold, there's a paper out of that guru's department um, that says, you know, Rick, I, some other protein is just as equally important for sensing or resolving flu infection. And I walk down the hall and Vincent hides. <laughs> Amy, the tragedy of what you've just told us is that each one of us who has done multiple years of research have exactly the same story. Oh, yeah. The words are different, but it's exactly the same story. The words are different, so, but the story is the same. Oh, exactly boy. Exactly right. And, you know, We're very prophetic be- today. I really like this. <laughs> Amy, what, rate, what do you have for us, Amy? So it's a new book by Michael Lewis. It's called Premonition. He wrote Moneyball and other books oh, yeah. um, along that line. And this is um, his nonfiction. Well, theoretically, it's nonfiction. Um, but his his 
way of viewing the beginning of the pandemic and how, you know, it was kind of ignored and five people or a couple of people really rose to the front. And they're not the people that you think like Fauci and other people. They're like the public health person in, you know, Santa Clara, Cal- California or something. Well, it's always those people. Always those people. I know, but, you know, so. I mean, West Nile started the same way. Yeah. So, and, you know, if it's a, it's interesting. And I think like um, one of my pet peeves about all of this is that we keep repeating history. <laughs> yep. Again, it's a story that we could all tell <laughs> in our own voice. <laughs> well, I'm going to get, I'm going to read that. That looks good. Very cool. Just added it to my library list. Alan, what do you have for us? Uh, I also have a book. Um, so this is, uh, the Secret Life of Groceries um, by Benjamin Lore. And this is a, um, you know, we've all probably become a lot more attentive to the grocery store in the past year because it was one of the few places that we could go for months on end. Hmm. Um, and he, uh, he does a deep dive into where all that stuff comes from. Hmm. And it is amazing. It's really, it's... Um, it's not exactly an appetizing book uh, a lot of the time, especially, you know, when he's talking about some of the more unsavory parts. But um, uh, uh, he he follows everything from where your frozen shrimp come from. He visits the, the shrimp <laughs> farms in Thailand. He talks about that whole supply chain and, and the, the processes that feed into it. I mean, how do they feed the shrimp? Well, they feed them with fish parts that they harvest off the coast. And there's a whole industry built around uh, that that uh, um, has aspects that, that are kind of shocking. Um, mm. he, uh, at the other end, he, he follows somebody who wants to introduce a new type of relish to the market. <laughs> right? This lady is introducing this coleslaw-based relish. And he, he says, you know, that is insane and I have to follow it. And so he follows that whole story and how yeah. the whole... Um, just really, you will not look at your grocery store the same way. I'm sure. Uh, after reading this, I bet you like that, Dixon. But Dixon Dixon should like it. It's all about the food system. As soon as he unmutes himself, we'll be able to hear his thoughts on it. <laughs> well, there was also an article um, in the journal that uh, t- <laughs> that um, interviewed the head farmer, the head C- or the CEO of like Driscoll Berries. Mm. And like how you, how you have, so like they like mowed under like four tons of berries when we went into the pandemic because there was no, no restaurants, no hotels, no weddings, no, no other things that use those kind of foods for desserts and, and stuff. And then he went back and like a month and a half later, they, the demand increased because we adapted to the pandemic and how you have to use all of this knowledge to predict what you're going to plant, especially for like berries where I guess you plant every year. Yep. How many acres, whereas like for almonds and other things, you know, those take a lot more time to mature. So if you plowed those things over, you're kind of in a deficit for like (laughs) five to 10 years or something or other. I don't have all the details. Makes yeah, exactly that's cool. correct. This, but this this book goes into the whole supply chain thing, yeah, supply and, chain, and yeah. it is a it is a ripping good read about <clears throat> logistics, which is quite indeed, an accomplishment, indeed, and I, I highly recommend indeed, it. Nice, indeed. very good. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, I have uh, Grant McFadden sent me this <laughs> with a uh, the subject of his email subject line of his email was nerd alert. <laughs> okay, so this is just amusing, uh, and it is called sure it is. Uh, the way ferrofluid floats above a superconductor is unreal. This is in a, an online publication called Nerdist, Nerdist, which when you look it up, uh, Nerdist is uh, a part of Nerd, Nerdist Industries, which is the digital division of um, uh, Legendary Entertainment, which is a film producer. Okay, So nice. and if you poke around on this site, it's 
nerdy. Cool. It is. Uh, and this, just have a look at the have a look at the film. There's no particular take home message here. A ferrofluid is basically um, paramagnetic nanoparticles uh, crammed together in a fluid, so they respond to magnetism. Uh, and uh, you can, he, this video shows a guy who's appropriately nerdy in his garage. Uh, show, you know, playing with a ferrofluid with all sorts of magnets and showing what it does. And it's pretty wild, actually, because and, and he's got some pretty serious, he's got some pretty serious magnets going on. Yes. What I really like, uh, one of the parts I like the best is one, with one of his more powerful magnets, he sticks under a piece of plexiglass and he goes to pour this fluid onto it. The fluid basically jumps out of the beaker. Uh, that right. he's using right. Uh, right. to pour right. it. Right. So that's cool. Actually, it, it occurred to me afterwards thinking about this. There are a number of, you know, hands-on kids museums that have displays that uh, do true. this. There's one that's here true. in Austin called the Thinkery, where you can uh, play with this stuff. It's it's pretty cool. And I suppose the one sort of mm, educational uh, issue is that you get to. It gives you uh, an impression of what a magnetic field actually looks like. Yeah because of the way the fluid responds to the magnetic yeah. field. You can so see there you it go. can't be seen. Very cool. That's right. All right. My pick is threading the needle. Uh -huh. Now, Good times. I, I know we have a lot of new listeners and we have a neat back catalog. And this is possibly one of the neatest things we've ever made on TWIV. Uh, Rich, Alan, and I went up to Boston uh, what was the year? Does anybody remember? 2013-ish? Somewhere around there. They have a high containment lab called The Needle. and uh, 2012. It con contains a, a BSL-2, 3, and 4. And it was not yet, the 4 was not yet operational, and they offered us to do a tour. So we did a documentary, right. basically, with uh, Ray Ortega and Chris Kondayan from ASM, who did the camera work and the recording. And it was just a blast. And, you know, nobody goes in a BSL-4, especially when they're hot. But this one was not, and we got to, and nobody's really done this anyway. So it's an inside look at a high containment laboratory. And yeah. uh, really well done. So you should watch yeah, it. And it's, and it's a view fun. that probably nobody will be able to get for quite some time. Because since the place was not open yet, but it was fully built... Yep. We could bring the cameras in and go walking through these hallways that are, you know, normally through a double airlock and everything and right. um, and really see the how everything worked. It yeah. is educational as well. If you look at this, you can oh, get yeah. an idea of sure. uh, really what a BSL, what a high containment lab uh, consists of and what the safety protocols are. And oh, one yeah. of my big in regrets of not making that date, I, I know I was <laughs> occupied with something else and I feel <laughs> so bad to be left out of the picture. A lot of fun. <laughs> and one hour good Really good video. Well done. Uh, we have two listener picks. Iradis writes, hello, TWIV professor. Sharing a pick with you all again since I'm on this space arc and can't seem to crawl out of this rabbit hole. <laughs> and Iradis provides a link. I think it's a SpaceX uh, launch and landing. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yes. I watched <laughs> this a couple of times. It's the uh, SpaceX Starship. Okay. That they've been uh, uh, this this huge thing that they've been experimenting with, trying to get it to take off, go up to I don't know, a few thousand feet, and actually gets horizontal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, land, uh, you know, uh, without uh, crashing. And this shows the whole thing, and it's very, very well produced, and it's uh, uh, it's amazing. Um, I notice even that if you look closely at this. The thing is not exactly vertical until the very last mm -hmm. instant mm -hmm. when it lands. Okay, so it's making uh, making adjustments all the way down. So this whole technology of being able to uh, land a rocket uh, is, you know, a sort of a SpaceX uh, specialty, yeah. and uh, yeah. they they're really really improving on it. Do you realize that? I think the um. One of the recent SpaceX uh, rockets uh, boosters that went up was something like its 20th mission. Hmm. Uh, and the the recent uh, Crew Dragon that went up was the capsule was at least its second mission. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, the woman who went up sat in the seat that her husband went up on on the first mission. Oh. Okay. And the booster in that, I think, it was the ninth trip for the booster. Wow. So this is quite a technology. Yeah, it's a departure from a NASA, real, right, which throws yeah. everything away. <laughs> yep. Cool. And this is a very, very nicely produced video. Veratis writes, incredible, incredible, gracias. <laughs> and Blue cool. Pilgrim writes, I just ordered the Scythe. Looking at them for years for mowing the lawn, learning and trying to find one I could afford from these people. And looking further into the company, I found uh, farmandgardentools.com and thought of you guys, maybe Dixon especially or the gardening fans. Please pass the information on to them. They're in Shelby Falls, Massachusetts. Sometimes, wow. sometimes you got to think about things other than viruses and biology, although there is a lot of biology involved in Howland Tools too, it seems. Love your shows and the Twivers, et cetera. You are living treasures. Thank you, Blue Pilgrim. My goodness. Oh, that's cool. cool. Farmandgardentools.com. Uh, Amy, you need, a, you need a scythe? Scythe? <laughs> no, I don't need a scythe. He said with a scythe. <laughs> they, got a, they got a tool here called a dibbler. Yes. What yeah, the heck is planting, a dibbler? It's for planting seeds. It's basically a handheld spike. I have one okay. of those. It's an I English, have... English garden. Well, except cool. this is a wheel dibbler. You can wheel oh. the sucker along. Right. Okay. Yeah. I was looking for a, uh, a cultivator, a weasel, uh, like I have. I right. think I picked a weasel. I think you did. <laughs> I have a I dibbler. Think if, yeah. I think if Laura came home and found me sharpening a scythe, she would probably get <laughs> yeah, very upset. I have a I'm not clear that anybody needs a scythe. It, it looks like a machete. No, no it's, it's for, um, yeah, cutting grass. I don't grass. have a, I don't have You grass. put a handle on it and you swing it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, there's I, there I two know. things. There's a scythe and a sickle. It's They're two different things. Right. Yeah, I right. know. Yeah, a sickle is just the handheld part. For yeah, I know. It's on the, it's either on the Russian or the Chinese flag. Yeah, hammer and sickle. I right. have a yeah. dibble. I have a, a nice tapered wooden tool with a handle mm -hmm. and the point is metal and you, and it's got on the side inches so you can know how deep to so put you can know, right. oh, that's great. for your seeds. Great. Very handy. Because all I There's was a always a recurring character in Terry Pratchett named Dibbler too, but that's different. Is that right? Unless it's <laughs> unless it's for flicking out auger on a plaque assay, I'm not particular. Like <laughs> <laughs> what is that tool called? Called a spatula. <laughs> it's called a spatula. That's right. You're absolutely right. I have one right here. There you yeah. Go. So unless like there you go. the side and the dibbler. Right. Yeah, exactly. And you so may ask, uh, why do I have a spatula in my office? And the answer is, I used I to. Ask that. I used to use. No, it's good. It's for good purposes. I used to use them, and they would always disappear. So I would take it in here, so I would have it for next time. This is actually called a Fisher spoon. Oh, isn't this cool? How cool is this? There's a spoon. Plus, you never know when you're yep. going to do a plaque assay. And this is the part you you carve out the agar, as uh, Amy was saying. Right. Oh, this is so cool. Yeah, All right, so that's unless, enough. Uh, unless any of these tools are, are are plaque assay farmed appropriate, I'm not interested. Okay, I, don't, I got I don't it. recommend using a scythe on your plaque assays. All right, that's, uh, boy, that's a nice nerdy twiv. 756microbe.tv yeah. slash twiv for the show notes, uh, questions and comments. Twiv at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Pommiers at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. <clears throat> This was a uh, the nerdiest group of people I've ever been associated with, and I'm proud to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Amy Rosenfeld's here at uh, Columbia University. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. I'll be back next week. Try the veal. <laughs> Try, I was just going to exactly. say that. I was just going to say that. Exactly. It's like, I feel like <laughs> that's what I should be ordering. <laughs> Try the veal. You're Except a comedian. I don't eat it. <laughs> Alan Dove is <laughs> at alandove.com. Alan Dove on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And tip your server. Tip that's your right. server. That's right. Rich Condit's an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Fair enough. Always a good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, 
and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>